This is off planet radio. Go. All right, let me let me do what I'm supposed to do here, which is host the show. And so <laughs> this is off planet radio, off planet TV. I'm Randy Moggins. I'm here with my co-host Emily Moyer. And uh, we're going to kind of launch into what is basically the follow-up on a show we did several moons ago with Cliff High. We're going to go back into time tonight, or maybe out of time. Who knows? We, oh, no, we ran out of time the last time. That's right. That's how that worked. So this time, we're going to focus on temporality and aspects of um, the woo that goes into time. Em, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. I a uh, little bit under the weather today, but I really wanted to be here for this, and so I've managed to pull myself together. And I will do my best to be my usual self. Although probably some people would prefer if I wasn't my usual self. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, guys, before we get started, um, I had a post on Facebook today, and I just want to draw draw everyone's attention to what's going on with Crow Triple Seven. I mentioned this a few weeks ago when we had Richie from Boston pop in as well, but. Um, uh, Crow's channel has now been completely terminated. Um, a few weeks back, he had gotten some strikes and been sort of sent to the sandbox. Um, and then his channel was restored. And he, uh, as of Sunday, his channel has been completely terminated. And what's very odd is these ter this termination seems to have to do with videos that have been up there for years and years and years and are in no way offensive or or even really controversial that controversial other than everything crow does is controversial but this seemed to happen after he had a particular program posted this weekend about zero and uh, so i'm wondering if some of this has to do with some truths that uh, were revealed there i've started listening to it i haven't gotten all the way through um, but whether you you know whether we agree with everything each other says or not i don't agree with crow about everything i agree with him about a lot of stuff but i like his point of view i don't agree with randy or cliff about everything but these conversations and these topics and discussing them are so important to stretch our uh, minds our ability to wrap around our heads around really complicated issues and we need to support each other, whether we agree or not. You know, I'm a free speech absolutist, and I will defend the right of someone I disagree with as vigorously or more vigorously as the right of somebody that I agree with. Because unless they can say what they want and need to say, I can't say what I need to. And so just it's everyone like, do the same. It's just, like uh, when, uh, it's just like when Dark Journalist had his uh, two YouTubes yanked last summer as a result of the Blue Chicken cult uh, filing complaints with YouTube. You know, this whole... And it's the social media, it's the YouTube, Facebook thing. People go into Facebook jail and they get their YouTube channel sandboxed. And it's kind of like we're it's children. We're, we're treated like children. Like, I get the copyright thing, although I don't, because quite truthfully, we've run copyrighted music on this show. And you can go back through my archives and find where I was just playing rock and roll. I mean... I never got slammed with copyright violations for any of that stuff. So I fail to understand the standards that are being applied to a lot of this in terms of how it is exactly. And is, is there a YouTube court? Is there an appeals court? Is there like a... a, a There's no people. There, there's, like, there's, there's, no, there's not even there's no people, of course there's not. Just, there's only there's <laughs> bots, bots and algorithms. The funny thing is, is when Crow was sandboxed a few weeks ago, one of the videos he received a copyright strike for was him talking about the BS of the International Space Station. And the copyright strike came from a company called Believe Entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> you know so like that like that somehow holds yeah, this copyright. just kind of goes into this even this whole patent troll thing that's been going on for i just was on a tech website about an hour ago and, and saw a very tiny little open source company that makes um media streaming software uh fighting for their life in the eu courts right now over uh patent trolls and names that they've used for legal patents inside the u.s so we've got this, this we've got this whole mashup right now of things that are so-called legal that are being used as loopholes to basically take out uh so-called offensive offensive uh yeah. posters yeah it didn't crazy. used to be that way about patents you know 
the uh when i was getting my patent in the 90s my first one in my name it um a patent was simply a right to sue someone for having taken your idea and not not cut you in on the deal nowadays though somewhere between say 1997 and 2007 uh government decided it was in their interest to be in the patent enforcement business and I think a lot of that relates to what's going on in Antarctica and what's going on within biotechnology, uh, the combination of the two. Wow. And, and so they made big changes here and in the EU. Russia had already made a lot of changes in their patent laws, but they were going back uh, more towards our older system, which basically will give you a patent because we've got it in a list and we can't find any previous uh, statement of that idea, but yeah, it's up to you to sue the bastards, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. that's, and also it's the inconsistency on YouTube that just is so irritating. You know, it's being used as political because they don't really post in plain language, the 35 things you can do or say that'll get you kicked off or that kind of a deal. Right. And it's, uh, the, if you read the terms and conditions, you can go through and do this exercise, which is based on a search algorithm that they use in natural language processing. And it basically re it reduces everything down to very simple, understandable, clear declarative statements and, and any that, that, are contradictory cancel out as you go along. And so you can get an idea of the vagueness of some of this. And it, it's not really a measure of that, it's a measure of a search algorithm that is applied to it, but nonetheless, it's useful that way. And you can see where in their terms and conditions, uh, and especially as it relates to privacy and their policies, it comes down to we can do what we want to do at our whim. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what it's really about. Yeah. All right. So just, I want to just let, remind everybody, go support Crow at crow777radio.com. Follow him there. He's posting his shows, that, uh, you know, the first free hour of his shows there for now. Um, and we, I'm already in contact with him and we'll hopefully have him and his co-host, uh, Jason Lindgren, on the show sometime this week. So follow him and stay tuned here for more on what's going right, on. There. You know, it's, it's kind of a flag on the field. You and I have talked about this. I've been talking about this for years, that a lot of the media out there, <clears throat> The media hosts and people there's people out there that have no websites they have nothing except what's on the public facing youtube channel type thing this is not a good strategy people and uh, look <laughs> I, you know well, we it, call it being in the ghetto yeah well it basically is but you, it also seeds ownership of your intellectual content to yeah. a third party provider by by default in fact, you read the end user license agreements is for Facebook and YouTube, and you're going to find out they, they claim rights to use your material, which means they basically have first rights of attribution in terms of your intellectual property. Not a good place to be at all. Yeah. So, but, I mean, you know, there are, there are strategies that you can use. So mm -hmm. um, going in, into the website is fine, but uh, make sure that that website has uh, a Google AdSense account connected to it and serves ads. The reason being that it won't be indexed properly within Google if it's not, because they're there to promote things that are uh, paying enterprises. So and that's number one, it aids your exposure right then and there. And then two, if you have a Google AdSense uh, account and you put in the required little snippet of uh, JavaScript at the top Into of your web page, yeah. right, it hits the analytics. Right. Okay, so they monitor what happens. So if they kick you off on YouTube and, and you don't have an AdSense account uh, that's connected to the web page, then they don't see the sudden increase in traffic in the web page. Stuff like that makes them pay attention. So if you don't have that, it, and also it's advisable to use Twitter. Okay, Twitter is basically at war with uh, Facebook and YouTube. Uh, not Google per se, but just YouTube in terms of their their. Uh, audience they're trying to serve and it, it's heavily monitored and used by the people that work at facebook and <laughs> youtube and they're they're really aware of what goes on in the twitter twitter sphere because yeah. it's real time and you can get a real time momentum and dynamic rolling and so the the thing to do is to talk negatively about youtube in reference to a hashtag crow 007 and just and get it retweeted and get it building on, on twitter thought yeah you know, and that much more powerful to do that than than uh, try and direct people over to a, a particular website. Uh, it just has far less of an impact. 
Well, I know he's, he's um, trying to drum up support on, over on Twitter as well, using the hashtag modern day book burning. Um, so yeah, so I think he's addressing uh, that issue as well. As yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use that linguistically. What I'd do is I'd use his name as the mm -hmm. hashtag. Okay, make it personal. All right. Mm -hmm. If if you're doing modern day book burning, it's like, eh, it's the holidays. I know I'm not going to, you know, I think he's talking about it as a modern day book burning. I'm not sure it's exactly hashtag that, but I did hear him on a brief recording talking about that. He'd moved over to Twitter and was making a lot of noise there. There you go. Yeah. yeah. So he was, yeah. He's, he's, he's using the term as he talks about this modern day book. Burning. Oh, okay. So maybe okay. a hashtag. It may not, but yeah. Right. Um, he's using that to sort of yeah, grab people, grab people's attention. Um, so well, the same thing is true of bots, by the way. Uh, a lot of the natural language processing bots that are in use at YouTube and Facebook are, are somewhat emotional sensitive. So uh, hyperbole, extreme uses of language get their attention as well as humans. Okay. And so the bots will rack up, uh-oh, our, our score is getting bad over at Twitter, you know. <laughs> we, we got a Twitter <laughs> storm against us. And they'll actually record that the, the emotional content is going uh, up in a negative value sense, right? And so they'll uh, they'll record that and they'll pass it on upstairs. That's actually like a, getting a free seminar on how yeah. to successfully navigate the uh, <laughs> thickets and briars of, of social media. Thanks. Belated, yeah. belated introduction. Welcome. Thank you for showing up, Cliff. Hi, you're here. We're going <laughs> to talk about time. Um, you where we left off the last time is probably indeterminate at this point because I think the, um, the emotional space we had in that last show will kind of eventually find its way back into this. But um, we were in the midst of discussing a paper by Dr. David Lewis. And um, I know you've got notes and I know you've got places you want to go with this. Uh, let's recap how we came to do this and what the setup kind of is just because audiences rotate all the time in and out of shows and that way we can set it back up again. Okay, the, um, the impetus for this is something that had occurred within my, oh, first off, I do a lot, of, a lot of thinking about time and I've got a lot of thinking about time as it relates to language. And the impetus for the show here was uh, because some things, some aspects, some uh, attributes of time itself, how it exhibits itself to humans, or rather how we experience it, have dramatically changed since the, uh, the end of the year 2012. They changed uh, from uh, perhaps November of that year through to June of 2013. In that period of time, the um, manifestation of time as we all react to time changed. Now, there were a couple of uh, things that occurred uh, around that period. And one of them, uh, strikingly, was CERN firing up and claiming to have uh, found a particular particle. And... Um, the, the interesting thing about this is that they, I, had, I had some kind of clues, so to speak, within my data processing, my very large data mining looking for prescient words. I had some clues to this show up about six months ahead of that, so mid-2012. And uh, the data sets, uh, as had been forecast, they manifest, and, and we had this temporal change. Now, since that period of time, we've had time um, exhibit certain uh, qualities that had not been easily found prior to that. They may have existed, and it, and it might be um, unawareness, but I don't think so. I think we actually had time change. I think there was a, uh, some form of, its, of a change in terms of how we experience it. Now, I, I wanted to go on to, um, to note something right from the beginning, and that is that the accuracy of the model I'll describe is um, uh, uh, very well thought of. You know, this model is very well thought of by a lot of the scientists that are in the know, that are in those holes in the ground, uh, reverse engineering space alien stuff, or working on a compartmentalized project here or there for anti-gravity or this kind of thing, all right? So I'm not saying anything that they're not aware of. And I'm going to 
we're going to try and stay out of a lot of the technical language because it's not really pertinent. As humans, we all experience time. Some of us are more temporally sensitive than others. It's probably a genetic deal. And it could be in the brain, but uh, I, even so, I think it's genetic or epigenetic. In, in any event, though, because this is the, the case, I wanted to note that this accuracy on some of these things um, is, or the, the model is assumed to be uh, for thinking purposes, 100% accurate by these scientists in some of these uh, compartmentalized secret projects that are much further ahead than the regular rest of us in terms of what we know about physics and how time works and all of this sort of thing. So, so that, that said, a lot of these fellows, uh, I, I want to take us back to the little bloop theory, okay, because we have to start from there. And uh, it all segues and spreads out, and it gets so so vast so so soon that that you can go in a million directions and get lost real easy. Yeah. But there are a few things I wanted to cover here, and I actually made little notes. Okay. And um, anyway, so the little bloop theory works this way: there's this pulse. The pulse travels uh, throughout all of known universe 22 trillion times a second, uh, and then there's a pause. Uh, 22 trillion times a second. So it, it flickers on and off really, 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 really fast. And that pulse has tricked our brains into thinking that we are solid because it's happening so fast we can't push our hands through ourselves 22 trillion times a second, right? But some people can, and this is, you can find on YouTube, here's yet another tangent. You can find this guy, John Chang, out of the uh, Indonesia. Now he may even be in the jungles of the Philippines. And this guy can take a chopstick and he can push it through a table because he can do this so fast. He's a Taoist. He knows how to basically tell the table to slow down for a second. He pushes it through and the material blends in a way that you can't duplicate any other way. You have to saw the chopstick off to see that it's actually blended with the wood of the, of the table. So, uh, so he's really good at this, but he's not working at 22 trillion times a second. I don't know how fast he is working, but he's working with that understanding that we're talking about now in terms of how universe is actually constructed. And so we go one step further with this. The 22 trillion times a second pulse, when it first started, didn't have anywhere to go. And so it crossed itself instantly and started building complexity as the various layers started crossing themselves very rapidly. So in the very first second, it crossed itself 22 trillion times. And somewhere along in there, there was a crossing of energy. This pulse is energy. And there was a crossing of energy that was so um, uh, large that it crossed a threshold as well, and matter was created. And we think this matter was a negative hydrogen ion the very first element in this known universe. And this is the little bloop theory. It's an antithesis to the Big Bang. And, it, and the little bloop theory makes time and space make sense insofar as, as our thinking about it and the calculus we need to monk about with it, monkey about with it. And so the, the crossing created complexity, which created a hydrogen atom. When that initial hydrogen ion, actually, excuse me, when that initial hydrogen ion came on in with its negative charge, it brought with it space for it to exist in and time for it to exist in. So you can't have a molecule appear without space uh, for it and without time for it. Now, uh, and, and, okay, so, so we get the first molecule. Now, we also have to understand that from a human perspective, there was absolutely no discernible uh, um, lag time between the first molecule, the second molecule, and the millionth molecule because it's happening 22 trillion times a second. Now, and so it's creating these things bloop, 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 faster than we can understand, all right? And so that, by the way, is this hiss that NASA has found. It's actually the sound of, of the little bloop theories, the little bloops coming into universe. All right, so there's a bunch of corollaries to this, this idea. All right, so uh, when this first occurs and, they, and the second uh, little bloop of hydrogen ion appeared, and uh, we're still dealing with a very low level of complexity, but each of these had space and each of these had time, and they sort of blend, all right? So, so what we get is a situation where space blends. Uh, it can be think of as locally aggregated and universally variable. 
there's no reason that the space, and in fact, we know that this is the case, all right? So as complexity increases, we end up with the, the lines of the complexity uh, of the energy crossing themselves to such a degree that we get something bigger than hydrogen. We start going through all the elements, creating all of the different elements, all the way up to elements we're not even aware of because the process is still going on. There's all these little bloops appearing throughout all of universe all the time. When they appear, they bring their own space. Thus, space continues to expand. Thus, the universe continues to expand. And, and, they also, and the time also blends. When the second uh, little bloop appeared, it, its little time bubble joined with the first time bubble, and it created what we now know as the ever-present now. Because each of these molecules shared a, a space, if you will, within time, or they shared commonly aggregated local space and aggregated time. Only some interesting deviations here between space and time. Over the mass of time, each little bit of a little bloop adds more to the ever-present now. And so time is also expanding at the same rate that space is expanding, and infinitely so. And so uh, there are certain, certain interesting things that occur from thinking about this. The first thing, as the density of the molecules that are created in the little bloops uh, increases, as the complexity increases, because bear in mind, this pulse is still continuing. This pulse will make me and, and destroy me. The void will destroy my body 22 trillion times a second for every second we sit here and communicate. But because the camera can't catch anything at that speed, it won't see the void. And because our minds can't process the void and are, in fact, absent during the void, they were unaware of it occurring. And it is this void that meditation attempts to seek and get you to, to understand and center in so that you have both halves of, of the reality of existence. And, it, and it's a powerful thing to also get with the John Chang kind of being able to shove materials together that otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't possibly uh, uh, cohere. Anyway, and so now as, as space is created around molecules, there's variations in space. So the space around a uranium molecule is larger and different from the space that appears around a hydrogen molecule, but the space itself is still going to join in locally with all of the other uh, molecules that are near it to form our universally aggregated space. Now also bear in mind that, that this is basically what allows us to have motion, to have that concept of motion, is that, that we are destroyed 22 trillion times a second, we're created 22 trillion times a second. And so that that is a, a, a motion, as we perceive it, is an aspect of how time registers in our head. Sort of makes sense? I mean, so far? Okay, so at this stage then, uh, we can note certain things. That, that the um, complexity of universe continues to increase. There's nothing slowing down that, that pulse. That pulse travels outside of time. So all of universe is created and destroyed 22 trillion times a second. It takes it no time to, to retrace itself and recreate my body each, each 22 trillion times a second. It happens within that, that space of non-time that is that 22 trillionth time uh, or, or a slice within a second. Humans have got devices, but our, our, our snappiest um, shutter, our, our fastest uh, calculator, everything works at sub-trillion levels, except for one or two cameras that can get you up into to, uh, you know, close to a trillion in, in terms of how fast they can snap. But, and they're showing remarkable um, images, but it's nowhere near 22 trillion times a second. So this barrier is still so far ahead of us that we're not going to succeed in breaking it technologically with mechanical kinds of devices, which brings us back to CERN and the changes in time. Now, something we have to note about CERN. Okay, so uh, let me see if there's anything else. Oh, um, time is universally aggregated, and it's locally cont contiguous and continuous, but it need not stay that way. Time is malleable. And we know that time is malleable because of people that have done research on time 
that we're able to perform experiments and cause the nature of time to change around little localized objects. But it, it's not like they can move anything through time. It's as though they could stop time from exhibiting its effect on particular objects. We also know that this is the case with uh, prisoners, okay? Someone goes in for a long jail sentence. When they come out, they don't look like they've aged. They, they will not have aged in their face or, uh, or body as much as the people on the outside. <clears throat> now, some of this is due to oxidative stress, but a lot of it is due to the mental component of this because there's also obviously still stress inside a prison. But there's just a different level of stress because in a prison, you're isolated from time. You're put into regimented time structures that don't allow the variance of time to have its impact on you the way it does in people on the outside. And so it's a known effect that prisoners don't age very, uh, don't show their age. And then once they get on out, they'll age very rapidly in a short period. And, and that's due to not having the defenses, if you will, to the, the vagaries of the time is throwing at them, and it just all heaps on them. And so there are ways to alter how people receive time, and we know that this is possible, as with the, the prisoners. You also see this with people who spend a lot of time at sea, where they're you know, in very calm environments for like people on long haul uh, tankers, this sort of thing. Okay, so... Um, now, time is locally discrete, but every bit of time that's brought in by these little bloops contributes to the ever-present now, and it uh, contributes it at the level of the pulse recreating all of universe within that, that 22 trillion time uh, slice of a, of a second. Now, this is where it starts getting interesting, because we have the, like the concept of missing time, and, and then you have to start thinking about it. Okay. So having experienced this, I, I ask myself some questions, and I, then I work very diligently in thinking about it for a number of years to arrive at certain conclusions. One of the questions is, what is actually occurring in an episode of missing time? Is time itself changed, or is it I, the experiencer, that is somehow altered, and thus I end up with what we call missing time? And I have to think that, that it is not time being altered. It is rather the experiencer being altered in such a level that there are no longer temporal markers being recorded in the body during that passage of that time. So basically I'm saying that the time still exists. I was missing in the time as opposed to the time being missing. Yeah, it's, kind, brings, of a, it's kind of a misnomer when you think about it, the term missing time. But what actually happens in missing time is time has stopped. In some cases, it's actually gone back because um, they do have the ability to drop you back in before they took you. There's this weird wraparound that happens with time perception. So it's time perception, but the time isn't missing. It continued externally. Right. But in consciousness sense, depending on the experience, and in years of researching this, talking about it and experiencing it, I can tell you that the sensory aspect of it is that you simply, you simply blinked out and came back in at another, another interval. That's the sense of it. That's, that's how it feels. I agree. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's almost, like, almost as if, like, so if the little bloop theory has, was flashing in, we're flashing in and out of existence at 22 million or trillion times a second, then it's almost like one or two of those trillion times got skipped. So are you thinking perhaps that maybe what happens there is that we're actually riding that instance of the bloop? The no, no, not quite, not quite. It's sort of like a shockwave writer analogy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, but but in, in uh, reasoning about this, uh, what I come to is that when you come back, your consciousness, and it is quite disturbed usually, yeah. it knows that it's been missing time or missing its temporal markers, and that is a function of body-mind. Okay, so something mm -hmm. is done to the body that, that it moves it uh, in a discrete fashion uh, relative to local time. So what I think occurs is that the um, effect is generated and time is continuing, but it's not allowed through some kind of an envelope. Uh, 
and thus whatever is in that envelope is not feeling, not recording the elements of time. Now, one of the ways that could be done would be to to s- sort of like snapshot your your brain with something such that uh, uh, you're you're frozen in in a uh, image that was captured in one of those 22 trillion time a second sort of thing, and then work on you all you all they want, and then release that uh, from whatever the temporal bubble is, and you suddenly start experiencing it again. Another way that is in a more crude fashion would be that there are temporal markers within our brains that could be flashed out of existence, like the flashy thing in Men in Black in the movie, right? The temporal dislocator or whatever the hell it is. And that is actually the more realistically probable approach because that's energetic. And what it's doing is sort of, uh, if, if we imagine ourselves as being sliced and diced 22 trillion times a second, in an, and this is in, a, in an analog fashion, but let's look at it in a digital fashion. If we, if we imagine that that's occurring, then it is possible for, for an unknown party to go back in your own a template for the pulse and tell the pulse to to recreate you not as you should be now, but as you were back uh, an hour and a half ago, if you've got an hour and a half of missing time. And during that period of time, so they could sort of render you unconscious, so to speak, do whatever they wanted with the body, and then uh, tell the body, recreate yourself as though we were, had not been here and just all of a sudden, you're snapped forward to so, the ever-present so now. Transport the, the old you, the you from an hour and a half ago, forward into so that sounds like time. A- so you're, you're, you're out of, so it's like however many little bloops happen between that time and now, you're sort of, you missed, seems like correct. you missed all that. I got you. It's almost it's correct. like a Star Trek thing where they, they basically re- disassemble and reassemble the molecular structure. Correct. Body. This and is- this, but this has ramifications. Okay, yeah. I mean, just thinking about it, one of the things is you've skipped complexity. They're not actually moving you forward in time or displace, uh, displacing you in time in any way, shape, or form. Let's assume a, 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 a bad actor here that wants to do this to us, and they come along and they zap us with this ray gun. And the ray gun is actually. Uh, at the very first time they zap us, uh, takes our consciousness and, and sort of freezes it, takes an image of us. Then they come along and, and at the same time as a side effect, it probably makes us go unconscious or uh, go into a trance or something like that. And then uh, when, they're, when they're done, they zap you again. And all it's really doing is taking that image, very much like a file. And we're all working on a file. A snapshot of a, of a, a disk partition or a database or something like that. Correct, correct. And, they, and we're just bringing that forward and recreating it now. And here's the ramification. In the little bloop theory, because it's all complexity and complexity is keeping growing and continuously growing and making the universe far more complex now than it was 20 years ago, and it'll be far more complex in the next two minutes than it was in the last five years and so on. As that's going on, you miss complexity. So it's kind of like if we're looking, thinking about like a strip of film, like you're being moved from this frame to this frame and you miss all the complexity that was built in the frames ahead of time. So it, okay. I, okay. It's, so it's like if, if that were the case, right. right. If that were the case, I could zap you with some kind of like a, a reader and I could see if your complexity was in sync with the rest of the complexity of the pulse as it's going forward, because you would have some, elements of the pulse sliced out of you, so to speak. And in so doing, it makes the brain, which connected to the body mind, lose any connection to the time that that is gone in between. And it's that weird feeling. It's not that you don't remember, because you quite clearly remember you don't have any of that time. It's a very strange personal feeling and a personal experience that if you haven't had it, you don't recognize because you actually have a segment of, of time that is missing from your experience, and it has left a, a residue on your, your thinking as a result of that. Make sense? Yeah, so that would, yeah, that would, that would um, sort of be an explanation of someone saying, I feel like time has gotten ahead of me, or I fall, you know what I mean? Like I'm falling behind. That would be sort of the explanation from that, for that. It's making me think of one other thing too. Something that happened to me, I was, um, 
you know, I like, I like dancing. I like electronic music. And I was at an outdoor festival that was on like an Indian reservation. And my friend who I was there with said, she said it was so weird. She was looking at me the whole night. And sometimes I would be there and sometimes I wouldn't. It was like I was flashing in and out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like she yeah. looked at me one time I was there, she'd look at me another time, and then I'd be back in the same place. And that's almost, for some reason, when you're talking about flashing in and out, it's almost like, would that be happening? Because somehow I'd become out of sync with that little bloop or, or what could cause something like that? Well, the very first thing that can cause that is psychedelics on, on her part, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. Because it alters your perceptions. It doesn't change your consciousness at all. The right. idea of altered consciousness is a misnomer again, just like missing time. Yeah. But it does change your perception and may very well allow you to see things that are out of phase with what we could call as regular, straight, complex reality, right? Okay. And, and so one of, the, one of the things is you. It wouldn't be surprising that someone like myself would be slightly out of the same sink of time that everybody else was in. <laughs> <laughs> right. And she just actually, she picked, she picked up on it there. Went, yeah, okay, I got it. Yeah, it's interesting. And so a lot of, now a lot of this has to be understood too as being um, part of really deep woo-woo here, okay? Because we are creatures in time made of things that are in space and time. And we're thinking and we're experiencing our consciousness experiencing being in space and time. And so it gets, it gets a little strange as to some of the stuff that goes on um, uh, relative to this. So, so uh, some things we know of, for instance, that um, uh, we can affect time. Uh, Cozy Rev, this Russian scientist, did a lot of experiments, and he did um, experiments that showed that biology and thinking could actually cause changes in local time in terms of how it, how it impacted uh, the reaction of, of things within the time, rather. We don't know that it actually changed time. It's really tricky to think about. Uh, but we know that the, the um, parts of the experiment seem to show time slowing down or slightly speeding up so that things aged or rusted a little bit, slightly a little bit faster. Okay, so there, but there was some consciousness that was part of all of this. Now, uh, part of my work in terms of trying to suss out prescient uh, imagery through time is operating on the idea that there's this ever-present now. And every time that a new, uh, you know, uh, quadrillions upon quadrillions of times, each 22 trillionth of a second, new matter is being created all over this expanding universe, adding to the total weight of time and all of the time being interconnected. Each time that occurs, uh, even though it may be very far distant in space, it adds to the ever-present now because the ever-present now is that pulse that's, that's whirling through all of us and recreating this image of our reality. And this is, the, uh, this is a, um, a better way of understanding it than thinking of it as a computer-directed hologram. Okay, you hear people talk about, are we in a holographic universe? And no, we're not. We're in an analog universe, and this is how, <coughs> how, it, how it functions. But there is duality there, which gives rise to to the idea that perhaps we are in a, in a holographic universe. However, thinking about it this way provides us some, some sort of benefits. Some of the benefits are understanding ourselves. So we're energetic. We're actually recreated by that pulse of energy 22 trillion times a second in our condensed form. But that means that each and every one of our atoms is actually uh, bringing in and recreating its own space and its own connection to the ever-present now. And we also know that the pulse is in fact consciousness, okay? There is nothing other than consciousness. Uh, you can't alter it, change it, or anything. However, we are consciousness experiencing ourselves as these condensates that are created by consciousness creating complexity so fast as an energetic pulse that it plops out in all these little bloops that recreate our bodies. Now, this gives rise to some other interesting thoughts. It means, in a sense, that we are indeed energy, that, that we have an aura because we're being recreated as we move through space and we're destroyed 22 trillion times a second so that we can move that next little bit through space. And it also means that our auras and our energy bodies are sort of, can be sort of thought of as an atmosphere around us. And that these energy bodies are expressions in the same way our physical body like is an expression of consciousness. 
And so the energy body around us is consciousness pulling in and collecting and creating all the little bloops that is, that is each of us and everything else around us, the microphones, the cameras, all of this crap. But with us, we have an energy body that is consciousness expressing itself and it's alive. <coughs> it also gives rise to prescience, to the idea that you can predict the future. I have a question. Is it, sure. Do, do, is sometimes this blinking in and out, you know, blinking in and out 22 trillion times a second, does it ever sometimes like make a mistake? Like, and something that was there doesn't quite blink back the way it was. And so you notice these ch small changes in the space or the time field around you or whatever. And then sometimes it repairs itself and comes back. And is this where something like, is that what the Hadron Collider is doing? Or is that what some of these things that are creating the Mandela effect are doing? Is that yeah. they're basically making some sort of like error in the re- A wrinkle. Complete? Let's a just wrinkle. call it a wrinkle in time. Okay. Right. Okay. And so, so, yes, you're quite correct. That's a okay. natural logical assumption is that it's not going to be perfect with us as consciousness monkeying about with things where we're trying to create enough energy to disrupt the pulse. And that's basically what things like CERN are attempting to do. Is and to that's why we're noticing so many more uh, weird like anomalies and errors and, and not, not quite right things than we used to because there's this thing that's interrupting with the natural electric pulse of the universe. Correct. And guess what we are? We are experiencers. We are vibratory antennae that is, that is specifically built by universe to suck up and be sensitive to time and space. Yeah. Okay. And we can trick our consciousness into being really dull about it and say, oh, no, ESP doesn't work. You know, I always, I always feel bad at my grandmother's house, and it has nothing to do with the fact that, you know, it's the place. You know, it's the, it's the space there or some other thing. And so you can, you can densify your thinking such that you don't pay attention to it, but right. you cannot, so you can ignore reality, but you can't really ignore the consequences of reality, of right. ignoring it. And so we actually are, we find people like Randy that, you know, he's highly tuned to feeling the temporal flow, so to speak, right? And everybody is to some extent. And of course, as humans, we have a variance in everything from, you know, height to hair color to whether you have hair, you know, and all of this <laughs> kind of stuff. So it makes sense that we have people like Randy that are at a high end of, of uh, temporal sensitivity in a way that, that is uh, perceptible. And we find it in the playwright, per, uh, playwrights and, and other authors through time that have expressed that, you know, Charles Dickens, and his ability to, to express what time felt like. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, et cetera. And so we get into this sort of discussion about time, and it actually is a discussion about us. It's all about humans or life. We can just say that generally. Now, the little bloop theory is really interesting, especially as what you uh, brought up, which is CERN. So if we examine CERN just logically, densify ourselves for a second and just go to mere facts. This is the biggest machine humans have ever made. It's bigger than the pyramids. It's bigger than all of the pyramids in terms of its impact on the planet. Uh, it's large. It goes through all those countries. And we've never generated as much of electricity in a single project before. Even the electricity generated in the Manhattan Project pales in comparison to what they're doing in CERN. And so this is, and uh, another thing about that is that CERN is buried in the ground. Now, this is a very interesting thing because of the type of ground it's buried in. You know, they were going to do one of these things in Texas, and they started digging holes and stuff and stopped it. And they didn't put any, any effort into it past a certain point. It has to do with what they found when they were digging the holes. It wouldn't work there. So having the big circle in a giant area like Texas makes a lot of sense. You know, you can dig that hole, and all you're going to do is disturb jackrabbits, but it simply won't function there. And so what they did was they found an area that it does function. Now, bear in mind, this is the biggest machine we've ever built. It's more expensive than anything, any single project that humans have ever, 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 ever done. It occupies an area that goes through uh, five, or it occupies five uh, countries in terms yeah. of the personnel and the distribution of the ring and some of the other components of it. And then there's all the spooky weirdness. It's basically uh, in Switzerland, but it was into all of the five neighboring countries. So right? exactly, right. exactly how deep is this underground? Exactly. Who knows? They're saying that they're, that we're dealing with something that's on the order of three and 400 feet. 
Okay, 100 meters plus. That's meaningless in I terms think, yes. of actual depth. The reason Correct. I'm asking that is because other research that I've done indicates that at a substantial depth within the Earth itself, and I don't want to, I don't want to shoot this off as a side trail, but just to say, at say 10 miles depth inside the Earth, you begin to experience another layer of temporal distortion. Because okay, that wasn't that wasn't what different. they were trying to do, though. But that's okay. not what they were trying to do. I was simply yeah. asking that yeah. to see if that was. And they they may indeed factor. have. They may indeed have tunnels going way deep, but the main ring. Oh, and they stuff do. Is, I can. See they do that yeah. definitely. Yeah. Okay, but the main ring here at CERN, uh, the collider component of it, was intended to be put in very special rock, and that's why its location was chosen. What kind of rock? Quartzite. Of course. Quartzite, of course. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And <laughs> and it's time. Yeah. Exactly. I, I, you know, I, I don't know if you're familiar with my th theories on Switzerland and time and uh, and how I tie it to tracking time through tennis <clears> and all <throat> kind of thing, Cliff. But yeah, it has been uh, very clear to me that uh, Switzerland is the master of time in more ways than one. Mm -hmm. Like that's sort of its symbolic place in the world, just as the United States is the master of military and, and Vatican is the master of religious control and London of finance. Switzerland right. is like the god of time, basically. You know, and that's where the watches come from. That's where CERN is. There's massive amounts of crystals in the ground there. That's I mean, the thing, crystals. Yeah, yep, yeah. Yep. And all the watches have crystals in them. All the computers, yep. all, all, it's all crystal based. Okay, yeah. now let's let's also deviate for a second. You're quite right that all of the computers have clocks in them, little vibrating crystals that go really, really, really fast. Okay, millions of times a second, but not trillions. Uh, but this gives rise to something else. In spite of humans being... Um, less than uniform in our appreciation for time and bending to time's uh, diktats, we are all now linked on atomic time, all right? And this atomic time goes back to these clocks that have, are monitoring the cesium atom as it vibrates and winks in and out of existence uh, at 22 trillion times a second. They're monitoring it down in the millions of times per second in order to get us all synced up. It is time that allows for uh, the blockchain technology to exist. It's time well, any that computational allows... process, actually. I mean, the whole, yeah. you know, I said this years ago before I think I really understood it. As I immersed more into digital technology, and especially as we went into the PC era, I noticed in myself, and I noticed it with other people, that we were, in fact, speeding up in terms of our sense of time and our functionality in time things started to speed up. We started to think in terms of nanoseconds for the first time ever. And, that, and that, all that at was, the same level. And all at the same level. So all we were now synchronized. Yeah. So basically the networking, the network effect was human consciousness, the human capacity to relate to time as a constant flux was being ramped up and it was also interconnecting. And if, if you think about time relative to what goes on with the continuous creation of new matter out in the universe, creating an ever-present now here, and then we think about time relative to humans being synced up on it, and we are consciousness experiencing time, you get into this sort of a little bit of a feedback loop there, where as consciousness experiencing time, now we're all synced up, and it becomes that much more easy to disrupt it all. Okay, because all of our consciousness is now getting synced up with this pulse. And theoretically, if we could get a, our consciousnesses synced up to the pulse at the level of 22 trillion times a second, we would experience creation and destruction continuously. Probably drive us crazy. But, but nonetheless, we could if we wanted, right? And you could live half your life in the void. Kind of sounds like my days sometimes. Is, it, is, that, <laughs> is that why they have the... Um the statue of Shiva, the destroyer outside of CERN, because they're very well aware of the fact that they're destroying and recreating the universe 22 trillion times a second with what they're doing. Right, that they're monkeying with, with the yeah. energy at that level, correct. And that's what that, that image is all about and the way it's divided up into yeah. the octaves by the, the four sets of hands and the whole thing. So yeah, the symbology is there all over the place. Um, okay, so now we have the idea of this ever-present now and all of us syncing up on it with 
uh, closer to it, so to speak, because we're now all working on atomic time. And then we have CERN, which is this big, had the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. And then there's all these little smaller colliders that are intended to fire off some of the particles that they then shoot at some of the other particles. And if we were to um, notice that recently in time, we've had, okay, so now we get back to the beginning of the discussion, because in 2013 and early 2013, they fired off CERN, and they achieved something, and then they lied to us and told us, oh, we found this particle, <laughs> and you know, the, the Higgs uh, boson particle, or you know, uh, whatever, they, they give it some name, it's meaningless, everybody just shrugs it off, oh, okay, they found a little nothing. We put more money, more tithing into the New World Order and into the deep state for this one machine than anything else on, on humanity. This machine costs more than all the universities on the planet, and, and it uses more electricity than anything else, and we're doing what? You know, we're, we're right. supposedly finding out a, a little bits about particular subparticles, and that's not really what it's for. Yeah. What really it may be uh, intended to do is to provide somebody uh, validation for our understanding of the little bloop theory. And they think that they're going to be, uh, it's possible that they think they're going to be able to twist time mm -hmm. and do things, right? However, it, we have to acknowledge that they're doing it with the planet. Okay, this is not only our first uh, largest machine that's ever been made. This is the, the first time humanity is doing a planet-wide um, uh, exercise or, or experiment. Okay, it's a planet-wide experiment. So what's his name had the uh, scale where uh, you would be at level zero society where everybody's using campfires, you know, generators and fossil fuels. And then you get to the levels, one level of society is when you start doing whole planet-wide uh, uh, things. Your, your, your resources are your planet. Level two is where resources are your solar system. And level three is where you get out into the galaxy. So this may be proof of humanity going into level one because we're doing something at a planet-wide level. Atom bombs weren't that way. They may have affected the planet as a whole and may have caused lots of uh, critters to say, hey, what the hell's going on and zip over to check us out because it probably created a great disturbance in the force at the level of the little bloops right coming in because of the radiation waves that come out of the atom bombs, not the explosion itself. And so that may be indeed a triggering event for UFO rush and this kind of thing was our monkeying about with the, the little uh, atoms and causing problems. But that was not a, a step into uh, actually uh, being a planetary resource kind of a thing. And CERN really is that because we're taking energy and we're taking all this electricity and here's what we're doing with it. We're creating energy supposedly flipping these little particles around and then smashing them into each other to see if they can create some other particles. But just looking at it at a macro level, we're putting vast quantities of electricity into the earth as a whole. And they're doing it in the largest continental mass that exists on the planet, which is the Eurasian continent. That the quartzite that they're in, those, that um, material is found basically running all through uh, way deep into Russia, way deep into China, and it is the, the part of the anchoring uh, rocks on top of the bedrock and then goes into the bedrock itself. And so here we're shoving vast quantities of electricity into the earth. And no one said anything. No, no feasibility studies, no environmental impact statements, none of that. They just, they, and they put all of our money and, and all of our treasure into this thing all of these years now and they're getting what out of it? Occasionally it works, or they're telling us occasionally that it works. So this is analogous and even much more um, draining to the social order than chemtrails, because they're doing, that's, that's just merely environmental. Here they're actually monkeying with the planet itself. And you get the, you hear the stories about the idea that, well, maybe uh, CERN is uh, going to try and create this one particle that's an antimatter particle, and it's going to maybe blow the planet to bits. And that's feasible with the amount of energy they're putting into the quartzite. They could indeed cause a rupture or a rift or something. Uh, I don't think that that's likely. And then you also hear the, the stories about, well, CERN is breaking. Okay, whenever it comes to these really key experiments, it breaks down and doesn't work. And so some of the, one of the scientists said, well, one of the theories is, one of the physicists is, said this, that one of the theories is 
that indeed it actually does work and we do destroy the universe. And so the universe being self-repairing, it comes back before we destroy it and breaks the machine. And so that we don't go ahead and then destroy it until the next time we destroy it. <laughs> and then it comes back and does this. And so that kind of a thinking that maybe, okay, so because we're in a, a little bloop universe, not a big bang universe, which would be a state machine. Once at the big bang had happened, you're going to be in that continuous state forever as it expands or as that energy is coming out and so on. So it's a single state machine way of conceiving universe. Little bloop is chaos, continuous change, etc. And so because we're in that kind of a universe, it's really easy to understand the idea of what this guy is saying. And because we are consciousness experiencing time and ourselves within universe, and the universe itself is created by consciousness whipping all around, it's quite possible that CERN is doing things that are causing the universe to have to repair itself. Okay, let's... So we are, we are consciousness, we are experiencing this whole gestalt, this gigantic panorama of time, space, continuum, and the whole little bloop concept. But one of the theories that I voiced, and I have fr frankly no grounds to prove anything by it, just a sense, is that we are the generators of time ourselves time being something that basically emanates from consciousness itself and consciousness quest to express itself. So the awareness of the things you're talking about indicates that we are able to fathom concepts that precede our own existence. Is that correct? And if it's correct, how does that reflect back to consciousness as being aware of time as something distinct from consciousness in a creation destruction process? That's okay. So here's here's the way to another was that, way to look was, at that. Was that a tangled up enough question? Sure, sure. It makes okay, a lot good, of sense. Good. Okay. No, it makes a lot of sense. Do, uh, and you and it basically is a restatement of a philosophical conundrum. And yes. that is, and the philosophical conundrum is as humans, we experience time but we cannot possibly be any other animal. And so we don't know if any other animal experiences time. And so we can say to ourselves, did dinosaurs have time? Does a chicken have time? Probably not. From, you know, from their perspective, they have no uh, inbuilt uh, brain well, they, capacity. They have cycles. They appear to somewhat follow what we would call circadian type cycles, things like that. Right, but that's not having time. That's simply right. reacting to it. Okay? okay, we have time because as humans, we are actually able to perceive and are yeah. aware of the passage of time. Yeah. In other words, is a dinosaur aware of the passage of time? Is a turkey aware of the passage of time? I think not. You know, they're just fed every day until one day just before Thanksgiving, and then their heads are cut off, and they've got no ideas to, as to <laughs> the passage of time. Happy Thanksgiving out there, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. But, but you see the, you see the point. I just picture Cliff out there with his guillotine getting ready to have a turkey. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but, but you see, the point there is that, that we actually have time. Other animals may experience some aspects of time and react to it, but do they have time in the same sense that humans do? And does that indeed make us even so, unique? What do you call it when, like, I've seen these videos of penguins that do this thing where, like, when it's really cold and they're, they gather up on the land and they, each, each one of them gets, like, 30 seconds to be in the middle and then they go back and create the warm, like, the, like the layers of warmth around each other, but it seems perfectly timed. It seems like they let each person, each penguin in for they get their turn in the middle for 30 minutes and then they have to go back out and participate in creating the, the, the sort of walls of penguins around the center one to keep them warm. And, and it's, it's regimented within right. time, but they're probably not standing there thinking, oh, damn, you know, I've got another minute and then I got to head back to the, to the outside again. Okay. They're not experiencing it that way. And but as a human, you know, we would be. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. We'd be trying all sorts of shit to stretch our men in the middle. Right, right. And in fact, look, we can actually alter time within our own perceptions. Yes. And we will do it sometimes to trick ourselves or, or uh, amuse ourselves, daydreaming. 
that has a feel to it that, you know, you're a passenger in a car on a long, uh, long trip. And you might just daydream as the, as the stuff passes you and you have a different or perception of time. Meditation does that as well. Basically reaching a, a state of timelessness. Correct. You're not, you're not consciously aware music, of time when you're meditating. Music, dancing, anything that has like a syncopated right, left kind of rhythm to it, whatever, all of those things can do that. Cliff, I have a question. Sure. I had a, uh, and it was funny. I, I had a funny experience just last weekend and, um, I was looking forward to telling you about this. I was, uh, it was the weekend before last. I was going to meet a friend to watch to see a, fil see a film that he had worked on. And I was late leaving dinner with my friends to meet him. And I knew there was like no way I was gonna really be able to get there on time. Like I knew it. I was leaving Silver Lake trying to get to Hollywood. And you know, I go the fastest way or what the, the stupid you know, phone is saying is the fastest way. And of course, I'm on the way that they're saying is fastest and looking at the way where they're saying is more traffic and seeing that that one's moving and I'm sitting in traffic, so I'm pissed. And I know I'm gonna be late. And I'm, but before, right before I left where I had been coming from, I sent my friend who was me a text message saying I was leaving now. And for some reason, I don't usually do that. I felt like that was really important. And I felt like I was working the whole time I was traveling to sort of stretch time. And I got to um, the area where I was meeting him and there's no place to park. And I finally found this building where I had to pay an exorbitant amount to, to park. But I parked on the 10th floor of the building at 7.57 and I was meeting him at eight o'clock, right? And so I sent him a text saying, I'm leaving the parking lot right now. I had, the elevator was broken. I walked down the 10 floors. I had to go out to Hollywood Boulevard. I stood for at least three minutes at the, um, at the crosswalk went across the street. This is Man's Chinese Theater, so it's huge. I'm having to navigate, go up to the third floor, find which theater it's at, all of that kind of stuff. And I'm, the whole time I'm looking at my, like, my clock and it's not moving. And, <laughs> I, and I get there, I, it's, not, it's not changing, the time isn't changing. And I get there and like my friend I, I, I sent me a text at like, said he was trying to send me a text at like 7.58. He was trying to send the text and he was having trouble. And he couldn't believe how long 7.58 was going on for. It was like, for some reason, something was wrong with his phone. I, I meet him in the hallway at like 7.59 and 30 seconds. We get inside and we're in our seats right when it, it's at, at eight o'clock. But I swear to God, from the, the time, it, it was way more than a minute and a, half, and a half between when I parked my car and when I got there. But somehow I feel like the fact that I kind of created that anchor with him and saying that I'll be there, I'm leaving that now, I'm, I'll be there, provided me like something to sort of work, like a rubber band to sort of stretch time out. And he said it was the weirdest thing. He couldn't like figure out what was going on because he was looking at his phone at 7. 58. Three minutes later, it's 7.58. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, you couldn't believe it. What is something like that? And is it, is it, was there some sort of connection created between he and I that was allowing a stretchage of time? Or was it just my consciousness and knowing, was it me practicing some level of time control, like filtering out some, some aspect of time? There's a, a lot of that. Yeah. And not, not just filtering it out, but actually um, interacting with it. So, so get back to the idea of our energy bodies. Our okay. energy bodies extend out much further from us the, physically. They also extend out further temporally because they're the, one of the first parts that's recreated each time. And there's a lag time on our energy bodies before it gets to the dense matter of us being recreated. And so it's happening 22 trillion times a second, but it is actually perceptible because we're consciousness and we can connect with consciousness. So what you were doing is this. Um, you were basically projecting your consciousness outside of your, your condensate and putting it further into your, your energetic or psychic atmosphere. So you were indeed connecting with him. And between the two of you, in a sort of quantum entrainment kind of fashion, yeah. you, you were altering your combined um, perception of the passage of time and what was allowed within that. So, you know, you see the, like the Jackie Chan movies or some of these martial art movies and where the master says, well, uh, of course you can float up to that window, right? It's only your mind that's stopping you from doing it. It's only your mind that that shows it thinks that you're bound by gravity and that if you really could could think about it in a different way you can just spring right on up there and so uh, i do a lot of this in aikido where they do the key arts and some of those things are you make yourself heavy and people can't lift you up or you make yourself right. extremely light and all of a sudden they just you know two very small people can lift you way the hell up with no problem at all and so you're actually altering the the local uh, conditions within space and making that malleable with your consciousness the same way that you can do with time. 
So the master in any of these arts, and it doesn't matter whether uh, it's an art expressed as music or whether it's an art expressed in a martial fashion or dance or any of that, the masters at that level can move faster than what the rest of us would seem to think could be allowed by the time that actually occurs. So is that, so is that what I was doing? Is that That's I, what you were doing. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was, I was aware, like when I got in the car that I'm going to have to pull some of my funky time, di time dilation <laughs> kind of crap. And, I, I, like there was an intuitive thing in me that said, connect with him. And that will provide sort of like the, the anchoring of stretch for stretching of the time of the time field kind of thing. And that's what it felt like. And it was, it was, it was very, um, I was fully aware of what I was doing the entire time I was doing it. And I knew that I was not going to be late. I, knew, I you know what I mean? Like I knew yeah. that you I were basically late. operating at an increased vibratory rate, correct? Correct. Exactly. Yeah. So she had been able to, to change her perception yeah. from, from the regular condensate level, uh, you know, operating at 60 frames a second. And all of a sudden mm -hmm. she's being able to operate at a hundred, frames a second or 120 or something, you know, double and so on. It's just like the people in war or extreme conditions like that will continuously report, you know, I don't know how I made it up that hill before the explosion, right? This kind of thing. Or yeah. how I dodged the bullets. It's just not possible. I and made it they just do. in time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, also, look, I, always about, I always think about like mastering of time as being, instead of it being like, oh, I have to hurry to get there 12, by 12 o'clock, thinking of it as it will become 12 o'clock as I arrive there. That's a much better way to think about it. Yeah. And, and so time is malleable. You've just basically proved in that experience what Cozy Rev tried to prove with inan inanimate objects and recording all of this stuff continuously over over a uh, long, long period. And being and so, in prison is the best place to record it because you're aware of every little... Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It's really the best place to do it. That's where he was doing it from, prison, right? He did the uh, set the seminal works while he was in the gulag. Yeah. And then, he, then when he was let out, he worked in a small little dhaka, a little house in the woods, and he would do all these experiments in this particular area that's somewhat like the Black Forest in Germany. And, right. he, and you read his writings, he's talking about all the experiments he was doing, burying these things and, and uh, being able to separate consciousness from them that way and do other things and doing exact exacting measurements because this guy was an astrophysicist and a you know glow or a, a world famous astrophysicist before he got shoved in the gulag right. and had had contributed some great uh, understandings of the nature of time relative to stars the energy motion within the universe etc from his work as an astrophysicist and he had no equipment no gear or anything while he was in the gulag and so he just yeah maintained his impression base and then he wrote it all down and began experiments when he got on out but but fundamentally he would validate what you were saying and so but it goes to brings up some other issues none of which we might uh, necessarily answer tonight but some of these things are, are quite interesting to think about are we noticing such things more because CERN exists and because what they've been doing with time is CERN trying to do at a planetary level what um, uh, they're supposedly doing to the, with UFOs to create the ability to jump in time. That is to say, uh, UFOs that we're aware of that travel outside of time do so by taking uh, a particularly dense element that's very stable unless you do uh, bombard it with a single particle and they have a particle accelerator within the UFO that shoots a single particle and it goes across the top of this a uh, heavy dense element and it causes that element to instantly vaporize into um, uh, antimatter and yield 100 percent of its uh, molecular structure back to energy back to pure consciousness if you will okay the underlying pulse it basically strips off the condensate and allows that stuff to become instantly the energy amount in the pulse that allowed that matter to be created and so that's another way of thinking of e equals mc squared that if you were able to do things, you can strip the matter condensate away and see the pulse happen. Only in this case, it causes this antimatter explosion. All that energy is turned into to causing a, a, an effect in consciousness, very much like you're discussing, that causes a big time dilation. And the whole spaceship can go from this part of the universe to this part of the universe in one of those 22 trillion right. times a second voids. So that the next time it's recreated, it's halfway across the galaxy or even further. And so, so it's this templating idea, right? That 
we're existing, our consciousness is existing in, in a form of a template. And that template can be recreated here where I am now. Or if I knew how to do it, I could maybe make a copy of the template and have it appear in Benares, India. And they call that co-location or bilocation. Right? Okay, You're right. in two places at the same time. One of the copies is always far less distinct than the other because it's being recreated uh, uh, and you're trying to manage being created by the pulse in two different places. Right. Okay, now universe is set up to deal with that. It's self-correcting. The pulse is self-correcting. But this is one of the arguments against time travel. It's one of the arguments against the uh, blue chicken guys, okay? That is to go back in time involves something that universe is not set up to do. So you can't go back in time. And what it's not set up to do is to recreate, is to create your template back before that template ever possibly could have existed because it's gained so much complexity since then that correct. Have, the whole universe would have to change its complexity in order to accommodate you correct okay so i've got i've got chemicals in this body that didn't exist in the 1980s didn't exist in the 1950s and so if i go back to the 1950s if it was able to occur then what would have to occur is the entire universe would have to catch up to the complexity of of my body in order to recreate those chemicals because it must are, recreate. Are you saying that nature wasn't always accommodating to glyphosate, Cliff? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that the nature of time is not right. really as we understand it, right? Right. Okay. And so that also means, I mean, you know, so it destroys the whole blue chicken, you know, 20 and back and all of that kind of idea. You just can't do that. You can't go backwards. Uh, what and about forwards? There's, there's the rub. Forwards doesn't exist. Now, neither backward nor forward exist. Remember our original uh, document here that talks about the, the, uh, the everlasting now. The right. Yeah. And basically, we've got this, this idea of the, uh, that the future uh, is, does not really exist. All that exists is the ever-present now, but it's being re recreated 22 trillion times a second. So because of our perception not working at that level, we don't perceive... The, we don't actually see, so to speak, we don't have any way of perceiving the flow of the recreation through us. And, and so as we join each new instance of the ever-present now, there are other shadowy kind of images of the next now getting staged, ready to be uh, recreated because it's happening in 22 trillion times a second. So we can go out, according to Dean Radin, two and a half seconds, three seconds, Okay, six seconds. Yeah. You'll be sitting there and you'll know, oh, so-and-so is going to call. <laughs> Absolutely, you know, right? Mm -hmm. And it happens a few seconds later. Or you're sitting in a, they've done the experiments in, in classrooms. You're sitting in a classroom, the doors, you're all in there all alone, and the door is uh, uh, shielded, they, you know, no way of knowing what's going on. And people know up to 10 seconds before another human gets to the, that door. Is that also something to do with the fact that our highest mind or our, all, our knowing mind, our all-knowing mind or whatever, that, that part of our consciousness exists sort of outside of time. And when our body mind or our present time mind connects with that, we get certain sort of hints or warnings of what's just about to come. Correct. Okay. There's, also, there's also another level of that. That's expressing through the fact that we're consciousness fields and that yeah. we extend way out beyond our physical condensate. And so uh, my consciousness field, even independent of the, uh, the heart rate field that can be sensed with a particular kind of electronics or like the heat si signatures that they get in, uh, in helicopters when they're scanning uh, crowds and stuff, right? right. Okay, so those are radiative kinds of energies, but our consciousness is much finer and radiates out much further. And so we can actually feel other people's consciousness yeah. and we can just, as you did with your friend, you can join those for some period of time uh, and, and also use that as your anchor or your altering in the shared experience of time. So the student who's sitting there in the lab getting the, um, uh, being the, the guinea pig, the experiment, uh, and knows that someone's coming and it's 10 seconds before they actually open the door, but because they've got cameras trained on him, they know his faces, they know, they know he knows 10 seconds early, right? His muscles tighten, all of this kind of thing. And it happens so repeatedly that they're able to just make it like clockwork. And so they, they, one of the aspects of this is that he's able to detect the consciousness field of another person. But we also know that it can be done remote. 
that that is that someone way away can send a robot in and you know that the robot's outside the door, that there's a little crawly drone. Even though you don't hear it, you've got no way of knowing it. You're aware because their consciousness has been put into that device to the extent that someone's focusing on it, driving it with remote control to come on up and trigger this experiment. And so this is, we get back to the quantum computers and how quantum computers work. Because quantum computers are like that steel plate that gets all heated up and then frozen into an image and you can read the image, sort of like the old shaman used to rip the entrails out of a, of a chicken and throw it down and however it happened, you know, it's the I Ching kind of a moment, reading the, the ever-present now. And it was and a blue influences. chicken too. <laughs> <laughs> He's a blue chicken too. <laughs> <laughs> and as usual, oh. it gave a pretty false forecast. <laughs> but you see the point, right? They, they thought, yeah. and to a certain extent, we know that this is um, a palpable, um, scientifically able to be studied kind of a thing. The reading the ever-present now is what they do with the Princeton eggs, right? And so uh, where they're trying to read random number generators and the random number generators become incredibly non-random just before well, that's what happens. Ingo Swan did when he was out at SRI he basically went into a laboratory and began influencing the random number generator to the point where he screwed their experiments completely up right and we shouldn't we shouldn't go there anyway because I have real real problems with the randomness of the random number well, generators yeah, within yeah, computers yeah, yeah. but yeah mm -hmm. yeah I get it but but yeah, consciousness intrudes and affects everything because yeah. all that is is consciousness, nothing else exists. And it's only consciousness tricking itself into thinking that matter is solid and hard that allows us to be here talking as we are. So that gets us all back to CERN and the potentials that might exist if you could cause really large disturbances in the force, okay, in the pulse. What might some of those effects be? Well, if we take a small example in my little bloop theory, uh, for instance, I know it is factual that the guys at the qubit factories that, that build the uh, quantum computers are doing everything they can to separate their, their Q chips away from consciousness. They're pumping out every, they're making vacuums that are, that are stronger than people have ever made before. And they're taking out more, uh, using more energy to take out more heat than's ever been done before. And it is my supposition that they're actually doing things in such a way that it causes consciousness to, to not be inside the pulse, so to speak, to not be inside that yeah. vessel. And thus no space and no time. Okay, or less space and less time is inside that vessel with the chip, and therefore space and time have less of an impact on the, on the quantum uh, computer part of things uh, because of what they're attempting to do. Now, it might be only milli uh, I mean, a, a minimal amount of less consciousness in there and less time and therefore less space involved, but it is uh, obviously working in what they're attempting to achieve. So maybe they've been able to remove a fraction so small we couldn't put a number to it, but it's done some level of good for their, for their computations. And I think that little fraction that's been removed has been done so at our expense in the sense that if you pump it all out of that container, it's got to go somewhere. It's, and so it's spilling out into the rest. They're making the rest of consciousness more dense around these containers as they pump it out. Uh, you're muted. They're distorting both the time and the consciousness field by what they're doing. Okay. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Now imagine, imagine this connected with CERN as well. Because CERN is attempting to do something on a planet-wide level, whatever it is, okay? Whatever their stated goals are, uh, or their stated goals I find to be ludicrous relative to the amount of money and energy involved. Uh, but the, whatever they're attempting to do is happening on a, on a planetary-wide level. And, so, and it's also concurrent in time with the arrival of the quantum computing and its spread. Now, um, if we think about 
the the periods of human existence and stuff, and we see think about technology, we can imagine that these quantum computers are going to spread out further and further as they become more technically useful, going after these giant numbers. The reason quantum computers exist is because places like Google have so much data that they can't search it all to provide you with an answer if you ask them to sum something or find a particular record. Data mass has just become so large that brute force computing is no longer adequate to arriving at which area do we search first in order to try and find the answer to this uh, question relative to our data. You can get so much data in your system that it basically bogs down on itself. And that's where we're at. So uh, Google, just like NASA, trying NASA trying to uh, assay or even look at all the stars in, in reality, it's, it's facing the same kind of problem as, as Google. As, as NASA gets its uh, ability to look at, at stuff out in space further and further and further and finer and finer and finer, it's seeing more and more and more and more stuff, and the cataloging becomes just a, an astronomical problem. <laughs> and so Google is also facing that, but, but quantum computers are basically like big psychic guessing computers. They're analog. Then they have a digital interface that goes to the programming language. And they basically uh, do things to make a guess at what might be the answer, most probable answer to this particular question. And 80% of the time, they're pretty accurate. Not 100% accurate, but pretty accurate. More than, than uh, what could be achieved using brute force computer, looking at one record after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other, to find a particular record. That, does, that works if, as long as you don't have millions upon millions upon uh, terabytes of, of records to look through. Because your computers get hot, it takes forever to happen, they can only go so fast, and eventually you've got so much data computer can't search it. So what you do is you slice and dice the data into some uh, pattern or paradigm you think you understand, and then you use a quantum computer to tell you which of these chunks we're interested in searching is most likely to have the, the element we're after. And 80% of the time, the quantum computer can give you a result that makes sense and you'll find what you want. But it's only 80 80 20 so it's, it's wrong 20 percent of the time and they have to redo it and what they're basically doing is saying best three out of five <laughs> you know so that kind you of just, thing you just kind of blended something in there sideways and that has to do with memory and from a human standpoint memory is considered to be one of the most permeable aspects of our cognitive sense in other words when in almost everything that we do we document things, we annotate, we, we store, we reference, we, we catalog largely because... Well, we're chatty we, bastards. Well, well, not only that, but it's, <laughs> well, no, 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 but, but it's subjective too. Yeah. The minute an event has passed its own event horizon, it becomes the subject of conjecture, an opinion, an analysis, all of which have moved off of the event itself observationally and this goes back to the old story of if you interview seven people about the events around the car crash, you get seven different stories or the game of telephone. You know, these, right. are, these are social references to things that point to the fact that we're really, we really suck at chronicling our own time events. In some because way. we don't operate fast enough. Exactly. If that's why it occurs. Because we outstrip this constant cycle of destruction and creation and here's here's the thing they send um the explorer critters the explorer things nasa shoots them off with the idea that these uh are going to go out and become v'ger in in uh, star trek you know join with some other robotic thing yeah. way the hell out and they haven't left the solar system right exactly one of the reasons one of the reasons they haven't <laughs> left the solar system is because they've run into this barrier and they've come right up to the barrier, and it's just getting denser and denser and denser and denser and denser because vacuum only exists behind the sun. And the rest of space, which we really shouldn't call that, but interstellar space, the, the You're thing that. dangerously it, close to my theories about. I think, yeah. here. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> okay, but. I think def it, definitionally, I think we're there. Yeah, that's the, we have to define what we want yeah. to discuss, right? Because this, this brings up all different kinds of very interesting thoughts, some of which are quite productive. 
So we know, if we think about it, that the, the stuff between stars is, is much more solid than the stuff behind the stars, and that the stars are burning their way through the stuff, uh, the stuff there, and in the process, they create the vacuum behind it. So of course, each, each solar system is very much like a cell. And it, it, we have a cell barrier in a sense, and that's what the Voyager spacecraft have run up against. But now there's an interesting component of this, that, that NASA, well, why, okay, there's an interesting component about it because there are those people within the science of uh, physics and the, and the science of the astrophysicist that are saying that, well, there's an, there's an extra attribute to be obtained from being at the edge of the cell wall within our solar system. And that is that you get to hear this hiss. And it's not just the, the solar system dragging itself through the, um, uh, through the material that's interstellar in between the, the stars. It's not just the noise of the sun burning up all the dust and all of that. There's an extra component to it that, so they're, that basically we'll just say it, they're hearing space and time being created because there, there's something to understand. The, the, when they talk about dark matter and, and all of that kind of thing, we can sort of dismiss it at one level because it's just a one way of looking at things. But if we were to imagine that the, uh, that the little bloop theory is correct, then new space and new time is being created constantly. But we know it's not being created within the condensates where consciousness is resident. So in other words, our, our universe is continually expanding, but our solar system is not. Our solar system does not expand at the same rate as universe. We don't expand at the same rate as universe. Our I, know, I know some people who do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've walked into that one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but you get my point, right? Our solar system is, is stable. Solar systems and stars and stuff are relatively stable, but the distance between them is not. It continually grows. And so uh, there are those within the, um, within the science community that are saying that this hiss that, that is able to be perceived uh, digitally or on our equipment, I don't know if it's analog or not, and then sent back to us digitally, is in fact, they think it's the sound of, of universe creating itself and, and growing and expanding with the little bloops coming in continuously in the space between the stars and the galaxies and stuff, because these are all separating from each other, but they are remaining relatively the same size as they separate from each other as universe is growing. Now there are of course stars that are growing and this sort of thing, but they're growing due to local conditions within space itself. And you know, there's more dust in this particular region. So the star flares up. That's not quite the same as the star actually growing at the same rate as the universe around it. It's just using some of that extra resources and is, and is temporally, briefly, a little bit larger. And so, so there's a lot of different thinking that, they, that comes around to this, uh, but it actually is um, it's sort of well understood by the guys who work in the compartmentalized little holes in the ground, uh, not necessarily the CERN folk. So can I so Yeah. One of the things that I have long pondered was the relationship between space, time, and sound. And uh, I went through a particular phase of my awakening where I was having a lot of I don't even, uh, information, sort of uh, theory, uh, ideas about sacred geometry. And I would sort of um, get into this sort of conversation, uh, you know, I would be kind of shown so, some interesting things through geometric patterns and prisms and different kinds of things like that. And I would sort of start to try and ask it a question. And so what I think I was talking to my higher mind or my knowing mind or whatever. And the answer, like literally, I would get, get all this interesting information. It would show me all this incredible stuff. But when I would ask a question, it would only ever give me one answer. It was always the same answer. And it took me a long time to sort of get my head around it. And in this conversation, it's coming up again. And it would basically say, this is the sacred geometry of space, time, and sound. And I, like for, it took me forever to sort of get my head around what that could possibly mean. I played with the idea for a long time. But right now, with what you're talking about, it's making me think of that. Is that idea... Yeah. It's the vibration, okay? And we right. perceive it as that sound, correct? Because everything does vibrate and sound is simply a, um, uh, a paradigm or a metaphor for looking at that. We can't hear ultraviolet light, but it's a vibration level that we 
and microwaves are vibration level, just as the tuning of a guitar is a vibration level. It's just that our, our senses are so narrow, we can't really hear it. But the problem is here that, that there are people that through meditative practice hear universe being created. So yes. some, med some meditators, for instance, they focus on light. And uh, they use that light to get themselves into the meditative state. Other meditators focus on sound. And you can do this. Um, there are those who will even use smell. And these are the meditators that mm -hmm. always have to have the uh, incense going, right? Other people are distracted by the smell because of how much the sensory apparatus takes of the brain. And so they eliminate that from the, uh, from the environment, try and make it as sterile as possible for their meditation. All of these things are intended to cause changes within the consciousness and its perception of what's going on. And so you can get into a timeless state with meditation. But you meditation can is... You do it with dancing. Dan I, I do it with dancing. <clears throat> I'm more of like a meditative dancer. And I'll get to a point with all of those things. Sometimes I'll focus on sound, particularly because I like a particular kind of electronic music that is very much about just about frequency and vibration, right? And so I will focus in sometimes on sound and the sound will create almost lights and visuals and whatnot, cymatics, but there will be light attached to it. And then the motion, and I'll start to even have olfactory sensations, all sorts of things. I'll start to experience like a synesthesia that, you know, started with sound, went to visual, came to smell. Sometimes I'll even almost feel like there's a taste associated with what I am looking at. You know what yeah. I mean? So the synesthesia yeah, yeah. of that all is okay. And that's what remote viewers do too, by the way, is yep. they try and have involve all four senses, right? Yeah. And they, because you get some information from each of them. What it's called, by the way, is when you're, is the light of intelligence. All right. So this is a metaphor for a way of thinking about consciousness and connecting with our thinking mind. Okay. Most humans don't think. Most humans don't know how to think. They simply react to circumstances around them and they never give any thought to thinking and thus have never developed a process for thinking or an awareness of it. If you read the book, Thinking and Destiny, you learn about how people think, how it actually occurs. And Harold Percival has this nice quick little book. Uh, you, you can read through it really, really easily. I say this facetiously because it's 1,080 pages, but it is extremely dense. It, it, there's not an, a wasted word in there. He was quite careful not to make it long just to make it long. He made it as short as he possibly could to cover the material that had to be uh, included in there. And he tells you about thinking. But the metaphor or the paradigm is called uh, putting the light of intelligence onto a particular subject. Mm -hmm. And this is not necessarily something that occurs in your head. So thinking need not cause you pain, you know, the right. way that we go through schooling and they tell you, well, just think about it, you know, and you'll get the answer. And it, and it hurts your head and it just doesn't work right. it doesn't it doesn't actually have to be that way you can get information in just by putting the light of intelligence on a particular problem that you want to involve yourself with and it does take a skill it's a learned skill and so your interaction with it was uh getting back the answer you needed to grasp to right. internalize before you could go on to use the, the technique and do it again yeah. and so it actually has practical uh, value. So uh, if you know how to do it, you can do a meditative practice just before you go to sleep. It does not induce lucid dreaming or anything like this. I had a big conundrum with one of the boats I'm building. Didn't, didn't know how to figure out a particular aspect relative to the mast and all of this and, and uh, come up with a, a, a device, a method for making certain things to occur. I know what, what I wanted to have it occur was relative to the crab claw sail. I wanted it to be automatic and flop back and forth at, at a particular uh, tug on ropes and so on. I needed a mechanism for doing this that was robust, was sufficiently capable, I could identify it and so on. And I wrestled with it for months. And finally I said, okay, uh, and I could uh, quantify everything I could about what I wanted for, from a result. I just did not have that result. And so you do the meditative practice and then you go to sleep and you let your body repair itself and you disconnect, all right? And then during that period of time, you put the light of intelligence on the problem and the light of intelligence reveals the answer to you. And, and so uh, I knew what the answer was. I went ahead and, and built it and, <laughs> and it's really cool and it's patentable even. It's a unique approach, right? This is how I usually get unique things is, not, is to think about it using these techniques of yeah. putting the light of intelligence on it. Yeah. And, you know, when Harold Percival goes into this in a, in a, a very interesting, detailed way, tells you how to do it, it all works well, and, and it's a nice, nice thing. It's not easy to, to grasp, and when, but once you do grasp it, it offers a lot of power here. So what you were doing was your native approach. You were getting your body out of the way uh, because you were filling the body with sensation. Women react more to feeling than men do 
And so you needed to eliminate the body by sort of like overloading its feeling component in order to free the mind. And once the mind was free, then the mind could go ahead and communicate with the thinker mind and uh, the knower mind and come back with some useful information. Right. And, and it is all vibratory. It is all um, uh, harmonics. And, yeah. and this is also going to be the source of um, uh, energy in the future with these field controllers. And we'll be dealing with energy in a different way. And we'll be thinking about it in a different way. Now, getting back to the time component of this and back into CERN, uh, this is uh, our first planetary-wide um, experiment that every time they push that button and fire that thing, they're putting more electricity into the earth than has ever existed before. And we are electrical beings. They're putting it into quartzite, which vibrates out throughout the whole planet and sending out ripples throughout the whole planet. And you get such weird things as, you know, like the, um, the harp guys with the spiral thing up when Obama got his Norway peace spiral. prize, right? Norway exactly, spiral. exactly. Okay, and so, so that was a demonstration of energy, but CERN is a demonstration of energy at a class one level, where we are a planetary civilization doing something to our whole planet, using the resources of the planet itself in the experiment. Now, here's something that they rarely talk about, though. We're part of the planet. Right. Yes. Totally. Because we're yeah. we're vibratory critters, we're not, right? We're not living on it. We are part of the Earth. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Every time that the pulse recreates the planet, it recreates all of us. So Earth is in the ever present now, the same way we are, and Earth is a condensate, the same way we are. So this starts probably, to explain why people themselves are actually kind of losing it, freaking changing. out. Changing. I mean, it, that would all, it would also explain why, you know, when somebody just all of a sudden changes overnight, like they, they were just completely, they're almost a completely different person all of a sudden overnight. It's almost as if what you're saying, it re-put itself back together, not correctly somehow. You know what I mean? Like it got distorted and maybe this is part of the reason. Well, let's not be prejudicial. It got changed. Changed. Okay. Okay. Because, okay. because I'm quite convinced that time is attempting to be self-correcting and self-repairing, just like universe is sometimes when time does this, it may be attempting to get you where you should be. And yeah. you may have been, you, you know, if we say yeah. distorted, it may not be distorted. No, you I, may got, be, I, I understand what you're saying. I actually agree with, yeah, I, I understand yeah. what you're saying. And this is actually how we heal ourselves, by the way, yes. too. Okay, we heal ourselves with consciousness. And those mm -hmm. people that are able to do this make their physical template better so that the next time the pulse recreates it, it, it leaves a little bit of that disease behind, so to speak. All right? And so, and so there's a lot of different ways to think about things. If you grasp this paradigm, it provides different ways of living and different forms of interaction between humans, human to human, but also between humans and their technology. And it's a, in a way that is uh, very harmonious with people that are awakened to the fact that we have a four senses reality, the pulse is actually occurring, and uh, things are not, you know, shit ain't what it was, <laughs> was made this, out to be. This actually ties nicely into something you brought up at the beginning, which is epigenetics. Like, I feel like Bruce Lipton would be, enjoy this conversation yeah. with us yeah. right here. Yeah. Right. And yeah. epigenetics. Okay. Just yeah. so that people understand what this is. Epigenetics is the ability to transfer behavior changes within your template through time. So you can smack your kid and you, and you do such, so in such a way that you cause an epigenetic change in that being. And he is no longer the same kid after that. Okay. Or you do a, a kind act and you have an epigenetic effect on someone by opening up their paradigm, literally creating neurogenesis and they create new uh, brain uh, uh, ways within their head, and they are no longer the same thereafter. And it's an epigenetic effect. Now, there's this thing called epigenetic uh, neurogenesis, and you get that from taking psychedelics. Okay, there's no, no way around it. So we have to differentiate for humans that, that we're not talking about intoxicants. All right, we're talking about psychedelics. Up until like, I think the 1500s, say 1538, you know, something like that. There was a German law that was passed that became the, in one of the, Germany wasn't a whole state then, it was all these little warring areas. But one of the German states, one of the areas in the Southern Germany passed a law that said you couldn't use mushrooms in beer anymore. Couldn't make them out of psychedelic mushrooms. Couldn't make beer that was psychedelic. Mm -hmm. it caused all kinds of different changes in reality from that point forward, okay? Prior to that, <coughs> beer was not an intoxicant. 
beer, even in, in its definition of how it was made by the Egyptians, was a psychedelic experience. Psychedelics are drugs. Drugs are not intoxicants. Alcohol is an intoxicant. It, it makes you feel the way you do because it destroys your template as it wants to recreate into the future. It, it is a toxic substance, all right? Beer prior to the German laws was a psychedelic substance, and it altered your uh, neurogenesis, which altered your ability to perceive things. And it, and it has all these weird ramifications. So, for instance, that law in the 1500s uh, was responsible for the um, uh, terrible situation that women faced in all of medieval Europe relative to the Inquisitions. You know, there was more than one Inquisition. There was more than the Spanish Inquisition where the Jews were, the um, uh, <clears throat> Spanish Jews were, uh, had all their money stolen and were killed. Uh, they were told to convert, give all your money to the church and we'll let you live. Otherwise, we're going to kill you here until you tell us where the gold is, right? And so the church was doing this kind of thing. Prior to, but there were all kinds of inquisitions that the church practiced against women. And the images that we have, for instance, of, the, of women on uh, riding broomsticks, this is going to get a bit graphic for those that, that don't really need to know this, but uh, it was because women used to, uh, they, were the, they were the sources for the psychedelics that were getting it, that were made and used into the alcoholic beverages. The alcohol was just there to preserve the psychedelic component of it. It was not the main point. Okay, so just like Coca-Cola today used to be a beverage that brought you the cocaine, the, the coca leaf, and then they took the drug out of it and you're left with Coca-Cola. So alcohol, beer, is what is left after you take the psychedelic experience out of it. And they had, uh, Germany had all kinds of um, uh, social customs for dealing with the, the uh, uh, various uh, ramifications of having people in toxic, or, or having them on the drug of psychedelics and how they're going to behave and so on. And all of those, those social customs were swept under the, the rug. But one thing that happened was women refused to go along with this, and they kept cultivating the mushrooms and using them uh, among themselves. And, and then it became a crime for women to eat the mushrooms, so they made them into vaginal suppositories. And so uh, uh, that's how they would get the psychedelic experience, and they used broomsticks to administer the, the suppository, and that's why we see witches riding broomsticks as a huh. metaphor within our, our social order. And they were the ones that were, were uh, killed. It was so bad in some of the inquisitions in Germany that whole regions had no women left alive. They were they were they would kill women all the way down you know, even down to the point where they were like eight years old uh, to get rid of the scourge of the witchery and that kind of thing. Is that how sausage became so popular in Germany? <laughs> <laughs> may, maybe maybe indeed, <laughs> but it, it certainly explains a lot about the Germans. <laughs> okay, right? but it was For throughout, sure. yeah. throughout all think, of Europe that it was going on. You think of beer and brats, like when you think of Germany, you think of beer and brats, and so you just right. gave us a completely different <clears throat> historical right. context <clears throat> for understanding. Beer and brats in Germany. We're in and drift, also, yeah. if you look at it, that was the, <laughs> one of the things that was involved in the yeah. fall of Rome was that the, the Huns were being paid to not attack uh, Rome. And they eventually uh, had the silver in the denarius uh, be depleted to where they felt they weren't getting really paid. But what made them so fierce was the nature of the consciousness of the warriors that the uh, Italians at that time faced. And it was because they had had shared communal psychedelic experiences within the tribal uh, society that they lived in at that period of time that led them to not fear death and to also be extremely creative. Now, they happened to put their creativity towards war and kicking the shit out of the Roman Empire, but it was they developed entirely new ways of doing battle, all this kind of stuff, and just devastated the old uh, religion. Now, also at that same time, the Romans had long uh, uh, outlawed the use of the psychedelics, attempted to put it off into the um, Vestal Virgin uh, realm of religion, and they had instead tried to sweeten wine with uh, putting it in pewter containers, which made it more potent, more intoxicating, and also rotted your brain as the wine leached the lead out of the pewter and you drank it. So it was a confluence of, of events. But what made the Huns so terrible was the psychedelics. This is, this is also making me think of like, what are the ramifications of this weird situation we have where DMT is illegal, even though it's in every living thing and it's in our bodies and whatnot. What are the ramifications of having that 
like it almost sounds to me like that could be similar to the ramifications you're talking about that this had in Germany. Like we have this weird situation where like we're, we're I mean, we're apparently like illegal to ourselves. Like it gets very. It happens if you go to Saudi bizarre. Arabia, you know, they right. could actually test you and say, no, you're carrying, you know, stuff in, in your blood. Right. You know, a lot of the prohibition stuff that you see in the uh, Arab countries is really, really fierce about not allowing uh, people to have their uh, sensory apparatus that's overlaid their c consciousness broken up and allow them to see any greater reality because right. it destroys the need for religion. Also, we, if you get into the psychedelic experience, it destroys the needs that drive communal religion. And at the same time, it provides you with everything you need relative to growing your spiritual awakening or your spiritual reality yep. Yep. as you are a human here on the planet. And it also, as we note, it causes changes in your perception that may actually allow you to perceive the pulse at a different level and at a speeded up faster level, gives you some different level of ability in terms of connecting your consciousness to somebody else and pulling that together and having that shared common feeling. And in fact, we try this with our giant cultural um, things in the 60s where we would have the, all the youth concerts and everybody would just be really, really, really buzzed on psychedelics, all entrained to the same musical wave in huge masses of consciousness that were in stadiums that are reflective bowls that uh, on the main that were basically radiating the the yeah. shared and consciousness creating, experience out. creating standing waves as well that were basically also altering consciousness. Yeah. Which is what the Grateful Dead did at Giza. And yeah, exactly. Exactly. And see, so, so there's a lot of stuff in here in terms of technologies that can be manipulated within our um, denser experience of consciousness uh, that still can get into where it affects the uh, standing wave of the pulse that creates reality. And then over on the other side, you have these guys trying to take all this money to dig holes, to run wire in the holes, to shoot electricity into the planet, to try and create some changes in, con in consciousness, which is basically what they're attempting to do. So what we need is we need to have ourselves one big kick-ass giant techno rave out <laughs> My they, they have those they're right. doing that right well burning I, I, man burning well, man well but here's the so the cliffs in case you don't know like, i have a huge history in the background and the raves and i still go to a lot of underground warehouse parties i love dance music and to what i always understood the whole reason that it was called a rave is because it created like a one-time energy signature like you have people there there's all this energy being created by the way they're dancing, the kind of music is very frequency oriented. Obviously, there are people on psychedelics, there's people dressed in funny ways. It's creating like a, an imprint, like a timestamp almost that like this, like this happened here now. Um, and that sounds like a lot like what you were talking about with the you know, Grateful Dead and whatever. Um, but on the flip side of that, you know, there's a lot of amazing things happening at places like Burning Man, but there's also like a lot of weird, dark agency related shit mind control, yeah. all of that kind of stuff that is tied to- and That stuff's always I mean, been there in every I, culture. You know, I, I kind of bump up against this thing where like I've had tremendously expansive and helpful experiences on, psychedel on psychedelics, but I also can very easily see how these are being used to entrain people into certain kinds of thoughts. They're, obviously we know that they're used in MKUltra type projects and programs and things like that. So it, again, it's a co-opting of an aspect of nature that can be really beneficial and using it for something icky. But we come into this thing where like there, there becomes a, a battle over whether psychedelics are a good thing or if they're a bad thing, if they're a spiritual tool, if they're a tool of mind control, if they're a tool of, you know, a, a tool of awakening or a tool of tyranny. Like, you know, and there's so much kind of tension around that discussion that, that I think sometimes these ideas that we're talking about get a little bit lost. You know what I mean? I know there's yeah. certain people in our community, they're absolutely, and, and sometimes I have some of these feelings myself that are absolutely anti any use of any kinds of psychedelics or drugs. And then there's others who are like, no, this is a great thing for awakening your mind and opening your mind and whatever. And I think I've had experiences on both sides of, of that. Um, to me, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a person comfortable taking certain kinds of risks that other people maybe aren't. But, you know, what is... What do you think about that? Like, what do you think about the fact that this thing that can be a spiritual tool also has been used in this devastating way? Just as it has nothing to do with the tool itself, of course. It's, it's right. the nature of consciousness that in which we're uh, living, all right? So 
let's imagine the people that are over there at CERN. These individuals, there may be some that are spiritual, but they're basically mechanistic. Right. They think they think they can get at the pulse with by putting in pulses of their own, so to speak, with uh, electricity. And so that's their approach to altering our base reality, which is really an effect of attempting to alter consciousness. So it's the, same, so, thing, it's the same thing as the MK Ultra fucker is doing, do, putting kids on the drugs or whatever. It's an attempt to artificially manipulate the consciousness instead of letting someone have their own free experience with it. So there's plenty of electricity and pulses happening in the universe that it is. We don't need to add more to try, try and create, create, to try and create. <coughs> well, we, they, may, they may think that they need to do it just to protect us, okay? Because everybody, even if they're an evil bastard, thinks they're doing good. All right, so there's um, really, yeah, yeah. Seriously, like uh, this guy uh, Temujin, okay, he was a, a Mongol leader, and came out of Mongolia, and they eventually called him Genghis Khan. Okay, mm -hmm. he killed uh, so many people. The Mongols killed so many people that they changed the carbon footprint of the planet at the time. Now they thought they were doing good. They knew they were doing good, and the Mongols, the Yellow Horde. It was all about preserving the ability to fight against the religions. All right. The, the, the Mongols were not Islamic. They were anti-Islamic. They were anti-monotheism. Uh, and they really didn't have that much trouble with the Hindus at the time because the Hindus were also into the psychedelics. Okay. So, and into that level of a seeking experience. And the Mongols were... Uh, they say it, well, it was because Tamajan had been betrayed as a, as a young man. And that's bullshit. These were herding people that had an intimate connection to the mushrooms that grow on cattle dung and, and were cultivating the mushrooms as well as the experience of the psychedelics. They were the, the, would go to great lengths to get particular kinds of honey because that honey would extract the psilocybin out of the mushrooms and would store it for a great length of time. Honey not being very readily available in Mongolia, as you can imagine, right? <laughs> there just aren't that many bees out there. Right. And so they put a lot of energy into doing things, and that tells you what they value. And so if we look at our society, we see what, what the mechanistic people value. We see them trying to do the things with CERN and so on, trying to forbid psychedelics, get people into intoxication, the yeah. mind control and all of that, where they think they know or where their moral outrage is supposed to be the guiding factor for the larger society as a whole uh, because of some uh, perceived value on their part that that morality has expressed over all of humanity. But on the other side of it, the, we, we can stay back and say, you think you are your body. You think that, that if we got enough computer chips all together, that computer would become conscious just because you have 10 billion brain cells, you think if we get 10 billion com, uh, computer chips together, it will become consciousness, uh, conscious as well. And that, that you think you are your body and have no greater uh, contact to consciousness as a whole, which is all of universe. And so basically, these are people that are trapped in this particular paradigm. And thus, they think because they are their body, that surgery is a good thing all the time or vaccines are a good thing all the time, that we're at a mechanistic level. And thus CERN is a good thing all the time because we can do it, right? And so it's like a Stephen they King wrote- that anything we can do, we should do, right? We should do. The technology, right. just because it exists, should be used. Right. Now, but they deny technology at the level of this particular psychedelic as opposed to that psychedelic to create this kind of an effect for the experience so that you'll gain this level of value from it, et cetera, et cetera. They deny that drugs are anything more than uh, chemicals to be extracted as the, as the distilled essence of the thing so that, you know, you get um, heroin uh, from the opium. And so they ignore all the other uh, constituent parts of opium in order to concentrate the heroin. They ignore all of the constituent parts of uh, the uh, marijuana until recently in order to concentrate the THC. And instead, it's the whole um, amalgam that is far greater. The sum is far uh, of the whole is far greater than the sum of the individual parts. And so they miss that component to it. And so this is an expression to a certain extent of the standing wave of the psychedelic experience in mass with all of the experiencers joining and interacting with their consciousness and altering that experience for everybody, the rave approach, as opposed to the 
the sterile, let's zap it with electricity until it groans and collapses or cries or something, right? And, and that, that duality, that battle, is, of course, the, the, another expression of the pulse itself. The duality of life is the pulse and the, and the void. And so you have these people that really don't have a connection to consciousness at a particular level. And so they, they think of themselves in, in a way that, that I cannot conceive. And it causes them to do these actions that are harmful to the greater whole of humanity. Now, some of the people in humanity are with that level of thinking, but there's a lot of people in humanity that are not worth that level of thinking. And so we saw the, the banning of the mushrooms in, the, in beer in the 1500s. Well, now we're back on another cycle where now mushrooms are going to be allowed or they're going to try and make them legal again in California. And it's the thin edge of the wedge. Really? To, I haven't, I haven't even heard that. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, and you know, therapeutically and so on, because right. they they cure alcoholism, cure depression, all of these various different reasons. And so they're going to come in under a medical uh, use. Yeah. And so, and so we're basically beginning to introduce consciousness uh, technology, if you will, back into society. And it's been a long four hundred plus years, right? Uh, uh, 500 years since since we had this occur, <clears throat> but but the, so the battle is extremely long. In so do you see this as on. kind? Do you see this as kind of right now? Because everything we've talked about in context of time itself points us towards the primacy of consciousness itself. In other words, everything that's the only way we get over time is through consciousness something through ourselves something that i've been trying to define definitively since i was about 15 years old about the same time that i started doing psychedelics and probing in time and consciousness to me are almost inseparable in this weird kind of way mm -hmm. i can go through my journals and notebooks that i was writing in that period and track them through 30 years and the themes are all the same. It's just this human fur furiously digging away at time and consciousness over and over and over again. Yeah. Cozy Red would have loved you. <laughs> he would have loved I you. Yeah. would have probably loved him too. Yeah. Yeah. But you're, you're quite right. This is exactly what's going on. And the, and the levels that we're seeing now, uh, because there's so many more people, because there's so much more energy, because so, the pulse is so, more, so much more complex. So we have these weird polar opposites of on the one hand the 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 gross materialists at CERN the 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 mechanistic science scientism and then on the other hand we have this other thing that's trying to pull the Bruce Liptons and and these these more holistic organic thinkers are pulling us back towards the but you're missing it think think to 1947 okay because there is something that occurred in the in the fifties. We were wholly materialistic. Even into the sixties, we were headed yeah. into a materialistic society that yes, was being we regimented and and broadcast and controlled, yeah. and it, it was a common vision, a common understanding. But nineteen forty seven, something happened. Those spaceships were brought down, and that's when we discovered that our technology, as the mechanistic view of reality would only take us so far and it would not take us into these spaceships because they discovered that when this, um, uh, when this uh, atom, when this intense uh, dense molecule there had that particle shot over it in that little tiny particle accelerator that powers the ship and gives it its anti-gravity and time dilation, which is just, that's the holy grail of, of uh, modern military society, right? The ability to travel outside of time instantly and have the yep. flying saucer and everything. They really wanted it. And it just destroyed them to discover you can't do it without intruding your consciousness into the process. So all of the rumors, Montauk, Philadelphia, all of them yeah. are all about the mechanistic guys trying to come to an understanding around an entirely new narrative that they had no clue existed. And that was that you had to blend your consciousness into the event. And we were talking about the event horizon and the experience of the event. And here you have an event, which is the conversion of this one molecule into a complete energy through its intersection with antimatter and in a, in a pulse 
one component about 22 trillion times a second, one of those pulses that happens that fast, and then you distort time. And they discovered that you can't put a digital control on it, you can't remote operate it, you can't get a drone in there to do it, you've got to have consciousness yeah. in there. And so what we've been witnessing since 1947 was the discovery of that through the 50s, in spite of the fact that over the top of the entire society, here we go, building this complex, we are our bodies, mechanistic society, glitz and everything that, you know, they sold to us with advertising and all of that. Yeah, and cool. at the same time, bubbling up underneath it was this idea that, oh, well, that's all bullshit. you got to get into taking psych psychedelics. you got to expand your awareness of your consciousness. you got to be able to start manipulating it just in order to be able to fly these buggers. And or just in order to, to navigate this stuff, which is why it made no sense to them, right? Which is why the whole society had to be turned upside down over the course of the intervening 70 years as we've integrated some of the technologies as best we could into our social order. But it only takes you up so far. And now we're just back to that area again. Not quite as much as with the spaceships, but with our quantum computers, they have to do everything they can to get consciousness out of the room before they can fire them off, right? And in fact, they've built delays into the enter button that causes the computer to run so that you hit that enter button and you're not sure when it's actually going to run and do the execution of that. Because if you were sure, it would affect the, exactly. the outcome okay. itself. Okay, got it, got it. So, so it gets really tricky uh, here. So it's like this where they figured out that consciousness needs to be used to operate these highly complex, you know, anti-gravity, interdimensional kinds of things. But now they want to, they, somehow they still think it's a good idea to remove consciousness to achieve some level of technology that they, I don't. I, with CERN, you mean? With, with the quantum computers. Okay, right? the quant quantum computers are sort of their way to react to uh, the consciousness, uh, they're, no, they're actually using consciousness in a negative sense right. within the quantum, quantum computers. So it's an attempt to harness it in a way it must be harnessed. They're attempting to do it with a device, not a being. Okay. okay. So, so it's a, it's a slightly they, different critter. They, but they always want, they, they would always rather use a, a device than a being like that. That's because they're mechanistic and they're, yeah, I get it. Okay. Correct. Correct. Yeah. But you can see where this leads. And I mean, it was quite the shock to the guys in the, in the Pentagon to be told by the, um, you know, when they go to tour the, the spaceships in Area 51 and the scientist says, they, they ask the scientists there, well, hey, you got, it, you got it all patched up. Have you guys taken it up yet and flown it around? And the guy says, well, well no, we can't because it kills anybody that tries. And, they, and well, what do you mean it kills them? Well... You know, we got to put our hands in these little slots and we got to, and when it happens, it merges your consciousness with this, which, which, with the ship. It wasn't that, it was really with the event. And, and uh, so, so far, all we've done is, you know, fry a bunch of humans. Because, of course, who did they have there? The very best of the materialists. Right. Right. The, the, the people that could, could control their consciousness and dampen it down so much that they weren't afraid to be test pilots. Well, the same this people kind of thing. gave you the Manhattan Project, the idea that it was a good idea for us to create nuclear fission and go bomb the hell out of other people using strange energy, strange fire. Yeah. Even worse than that, though, of course, in that same period of time, they blew off uh, atomic bombs up in the atmosphere. Yeah. It, deliberately. To Deliber not, yeah. yeah, not as a test of the bomb, but as a test of certain effects on the atmosphere, because they, are, uh, they were thinking at that time that there was a potential that they could cause a disruption that would allow some of these consciousness effect things to not be the case. <laughs> okay. So, in other words, it's sort of like CERN. This really is a war on consciousness. Yeah. Correct. This, Correct. Is, ti this is the time wars, and this yeah. is the war on consciousness. Now, bear in mind, you have to be mechanistic to be able to think. I know. You can, you can take your template and <laughs> right. shove it through time, right? Right. And that it won't harm you. You have to be really mechanistic to think that your template for your body is going to still exist if you were to shove it back in 1985 or attempt to. You're going to have to be really mechanistic to not understand that the consciousness that existed in 1985 does not exist now. 
as it did in 1985. Those people are dead or, or matured or changed. And, and so there is no past frame to go back into. There's just the ever-present now constantly hammering on us. However, we have the ability to see into the future. But as you were talking about earlier in documentation, we must record what is happening in the now because the past becomes fuzzy. The past is actually a lot fuzzier than the, the very near future. If you're driving down the road and you get a, in heavy traffic at a fast uh, speed and you get a gut instinct and feeling that there's going to be an accident, that accident is happening in the future, coming right towards you and manifesting. Exactly. And it's a lot sharper feeling than you will report yeah. that accident after the fact. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I can, I can attest to that, having survived a head-on collision in, in a very tiny little car with a tractor trailer when I was 17. That, that event, looking back at it, I have no idea, well, I don't remember anymore. Right. But when I do I have those flash moments of remembering, it's quite horrible. And I have to say that it probably has tempered my ability now to anticipate the road ahead. <laughs> I'm quite sure it has. <laughs> yeah. No question about that. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's it's a whole different kind of uh, take on time perception. Exactly. Yeah. 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 The timing was and you know, and they shock people trying to do that shit to them deliberately. Well, the military, was, the MK Ultra stuff. Yeah. They were attempting yeah. to achieve what nature frequently produces. Yeah. Shock, isolation, drowning. All of the all of the the torture modalities were designed to create schisms, you know, whether they actually intended to produce alters, they did that, but it was an attempt to shock consciousness into another direction. There you go. Now, here's something to know that the, um, the Inquisition, the methods that they chose to dispatch people in the Inquisition were designed to cause a temporal shock on that consciousness such that they would not reincarnate within a short period of time. All right, such they would reincarnate longer, further out. There's a, not only is there a war on consciousness, there is a war through time. We have ex uh, uh, evidence of this. And the evidence yeah. recently is Obama and all these people finding images of themselves from past lives. Because when we re reincarnate, we have a tendency to reincarnate looking mostly like we do now because we're working off of the same template at its core, which brings along with it all of our karma and everything. And we call that template the soul. And when you reincarnate each time, yep. your soul brings with you yes. into this universe the stuff you need to deal with. And so, you know, it, it you know, made me ball that kind of thing right i mean it carries from from life to life to life to life what did you do to deserve what did you do to deserve that man <laughs> well that's less of an issue than, than what i did to deserve the well i'm I, like i say i've offended the housing gods <laughs> because of the situation i've had in this life yeah. with housing issues right and it, and it's it's a pattern i mean there was obviously something that was going on as a military brat you, you don't have the concept of uh, ownership of a space at all. Right. You're, right. you're constantly kicked around. And so, you know, I think that to a certain extent, people that incarnate as military brats uh, uh, may have offended the housing gods. <laughs> I just put it that way. But, but you see how we carry this stuff forward with us and we have to deal with this, these kinds of things in this life. And it's just really interesting, I find it as, it as I go forward in time, just thinking about this, especially in relation to time and the, um, the things that we have to deal with. So on the, our energy bodies, remember, that extend way out from us. That's where the soul tags or puts all of our karma that we have to deal with at specific points in our, in our history. And so wounds you get are actually going to be struck on your energy body long before it gets into your, uh, your corpus, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and so if you were really psychic, uh, really observant, you might see your energy body getting wounded and lessen the effect on you. Now, getting back to John Chang, the guy in the, in the Indonesian rainforest that can put a, a chopstick through a, through a table, that can blend different materials with his mind. He's able to travel with um, uh, and drive in horrific conditions in Indonesia. You know, there's no speed limits and stuff on the freeway. Lots of people are killed and destroyed in their car wrecks and so forth. But he's, and he's been in horrific car crashes where they've had to cut him out with, 
with uh, devices. And he's had this, had this happen with himself and other people in the car. And literally, I know of a guy who was with him and rode in one of these cars uh, with him driving, with John Chang driving. And a millisecond before the accident occurred, John Chang reached over and put his hand gently on the guy's shoulder. And they were in a, involved in a crash at something over 90 miles an hour. The guy could no longer look when he saw, saw it creeping up at 120 kilometers an hour. He could no longer look at the speedometer. But they, they were involved in this crash. The two of them, it took them hours to cut them out of the crash, and they came out unharmed because John Chang was able to control the outcome of that accident relative to the, the ability he has with the temporal reality manifesting and the templates and all of this kind of stuff because he knew what was coming within that energy and body. And he extended his field to that person. Correct, correct. And so very, and that person has, has got a, I think one or two articles written about being in that car wreck with him. And uh, they're out and about, I don't know, I'll see if I can find them just because they're you interesting. Can find those, I'd like to be able to post those out with the show. Yeah, it's on, I think he references, uh, the guy references it in um, uh, Magus from Jakarta or something like that. It was the, was the book. And he gives you pointers to it, to some of the stories. But what, again, was interesting was conscious control of temporal reality as it unfolded. And humans, of course, as we see, Randy, that's, that's what you should be striving for, is John Chang kind of control. You've got various, obviously got the sensitivity, just need to get that stuff tuned in. Yeah, yeah. Well, that is the goal. The goal is to be able to, and that should be everybody's goal, quite frankly. Yeah. Every conscious person, we all need to figure this out. Because this is how we get over where we're at right now. You see, the mechanistic, the mes mechanistic militaristic minds want to keep us entrained into that system because they, they, it scares the shit out of them what we actually can do once we, we begin to move into this. I mean, yeah. having tasted it at different times in my life, I can tell you that if you could extrapolate it out and build it, it's very scary stuff. Not from the standpoint of scaring us, but scaring somebody who does not comprehend the power of operating in these, in these frequencies, in these wavelengths, in these timelines. Right, and this is the difference between um, magicians and wizards who are mechanistic, okay, and want to do stuff with mechanical kind of e elixirs and so yeah. on versus yeah. the sorcerer. And the sorcerer might consume source in the sense of a magic mushroom in order to get a, ve a better uh, handle on the manifestation of the templates around them for a specific task. And so shaman or, you know, a real good shaman, a curandero can cure people by altering their consciousness in a shared psychedelic experience. Or, and so this is extremely powerful and it's, it's, it's dismissed, not believed, it's anecdotal, you know, all of these kind of things. Nonetheless, it's a reality that the military and everybody ran into in the, in the late uh, 40s that led them to undo a lot of the stuff in the 60s that we'd been aiming for in the 50s. And so it was, the people will give you a, a conclusion that the anti-war movement of the early 60s was derailed with psychedelics deliberately. And they may have indeed uh, enjoyed that effect, that the kids that were the straight, you know, when you see the anti-war movement in the, in the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s, it is your uh, um, righteous Republican teenager. It's the crew cut kid yeah. with, with the... Pictures, right, there's pictures of like the Columbia University crowd uh, very early in the Vietnam War protest, probably like 65. And you look at them, they are not the disheveled acid, acid freak tippies. They really are lettermen and, and, and scholars coming out of Ivy League institutions. It was uh, what the elite of the, you know, the, the yeah. next strata of the elite, yeah. and it was against it. And so there were people that will claim that they introduced the drugs into society in order to disrupt that. But of course, there's all different kinds of layers of agendas in, in any of these operations. But it's my supposition that what was done was an attempt to alter the 
the flow of our society such that we are at where we are at now and that they had to do it because we were taking a huge cut away from consciousness and we need consciousness to run this technology and we need to run this technology because they have it they being the other and we must necessarily being xenophobic creatures fear the other until we are feel ourselves to be their equal or at least you know can defend ourselves that kind of thing right and so yeah. i it's my supposition that if you will it was sort of a training exercise to see who has the capacity to take the psychedelics, alter their consciousness, and thus maybe be able to be used in the future. Now, at the same time, in this constant battle that's going on, they did not derail. So the people that stared at goats, that kind of crowd within the military, did not derail the people that ultimately led to CERN. And they're both after the same goal. It's just that one recognizes that CERN cannot possibly achieve what they're after and the other does not, and they're attempting to do the CERN kind of thing. And they're the ones that are causing us the temporal um, disharmony or changes that we were talking about earlier, the template trying to repair itself, this sort of thing, right? So maybe what really needs to happen here is that we collectively, those of us who I would consider to be part of this awareness that we're talking about, the consciousness, be able to begin to use sort of a, an energetic jujitsu type reversing, <laughs> reversing the energy. Because actually, I think that's what's been going on anyway. I really think the effects of a lot of these extreme events, whether it was the atomic bombs or CERN, or all of the things in between that, all of the black science, in some ways have been mitigated by the effect of this consciousness force that's sitting out there operating sort of silently in the background right now. I would agree. I think you're 100% correct that it has been mitigated. The change has occurred. The uh, mechanistic view is losing. Yeah. It's still doing the weird shit, like you know, trying is. to create the shocks like in Vegas at all you know, all of that business, but it's becoming less and less effective over time. They think that that's because of the dilution because of more and more people and mass communications. I don't. I agree with Randy and think that it's because consciousness yeah. has been um, unfettered by our paradigms. Yeah, I don't, I don't think the mass communication thing has anything to do with it because all you see the no. mass communication does is cause a bunch of people to argue and fight, yell and call each other names and this and that and the other thing. I agree with you. It's about this general rise in a certain kind of consciousness that is disrupting. The, it, has, yeah. it has felt like a war for so long. And quite honestly, I think it is a collective in a sense. I feel like I'm kind of a part of it. And I'm not saying that with any pride or anything advancing forward. It's just when I look back and I review, I have to take my own notes. I mean, I, I'm, I'm one of those guys. I write shit down. All, I got a thousand <laughs> of these things laying around all over the place. Pens and tablets. I am habitual about it. Yeah. It's how I chronicle anything that I'm doing on a moment by moment basis, post-its, I live off post-its. Yeah. <laughs> so the war for consciousness has been going on forever and it's very heightened right now. And um, I'd like to think this talk tonight specifically, I think the last one was more of a prelude, has kind of tossed some ideas and concepts out there that now some people can begin to really chew on and really begin to come to understand this. I don't think we're done. I think, I don't know how far we got in your notes. Uh, but, we're down about half of one page. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got a few more pages perfect. inside some perfect. drawings well, as well. We can formally serialize this and just, just <laughs> yeah. kind of bookmark it. Because I, I, was, I was actually, I noticed my mind going into some interesting places listening yeah. to this. Yep. And I would like to think that these are seeds of thought an intent to put out there right now to counter some of the stink, frankly, that's rolling off of the military industrial complex grid right now. I like to think of it as gristle, okay? There something really yeah, tough to chew on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Give them something to gnaw on. Yeah, exactly. Right, right, right. But let them know that we've made our statement and that uh, we're putting them on notice. 
And it doesn't matter. It turns out consciousness, if, if they're aware we're going to bitch slap them, it won't matter. That'll still, still hit exactly. that cheek. They're going to yeah. be what they're going to be and they're going to do what they're going to do. And hey, you know, as a warriors in this whole process, because at some point you stop becoming a, uh, you know, one of the diaspora people being shifted around, one of the displaced yeah. humans, and you decide you're going to enjoin in this, in, engage in this, and and as warriors in this, uh, in this battle, uh, I find it very comforting to say that I am great. And I am great because I face the greatest of all enemies. Mm -hmm. And I define myself by how great my enemy is. Far better to go to battle with the ultimate exactly. than, than exactly. some piddly ass little warlord somewhere. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like you know. the best martial arts film you've ever seen. Yeah. And we're well, living it. <laughs> we are living it. And we yep. were born for it. That's the interesting thing about it. You know, above all else, I think you sense it. Emily and I have talked about this endlessly. We know we were supposed to be here in this time frame. We know what we're supposed to do, and we're, we're fucking doing it. Yeah, and yeah. kicking ass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anything else we got? One more pass around, and then we'll kind of wrap this up. Well, my, my takeaway from this evening, aside from all the other interesting stuff, is that, Randy, in a previous life, you must have been a musical conductor because the way you work that <laughs> eloquently, right? <laughs> You're, like, conducting this time symphony that we're all just playing along in. Yeah. So, well, he's running several thing. seconds ahead of you and I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, I, I've, I've felt myself advancing in speed because of my connection with him, you know what I mean, to, to doing that. Like, I experienced and had some of these things before but i didn't feel so much like i don't know that i that i sensed it as a because of him kind of thing in any way but since i began my interacting with him i feel more in control of my ability to do this thing with time than before it felt like something was just happening you All know right. what i mean so i feel like it's it's definitely made me more temporally aware and um you know it's it is it is interesting yeah it is. It's some it's some good stuff to chew on and think about. Yeah, it is. yeah. This is healthy. This is uh, high nutritional value. I'd like to. Yeah. <laughs> well, I I think of it as the deep woo. You know, deep woo. Yeah, we that's what that's that's the only woo we're really interested in. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Get to the real stuff. Yeah, and uh, just uh, curious. Are you, um, are, are you doing full reports again? Are you doing the Atla reports, or are we still working on the? Uh, no, I'm still doing the crypto ones here recently, but I've come up with a, a programming project that I won't talk about that that uh, at the moment because I don't want to spoil it. It's like uh, Hemingway, you know, he's uh, told more good stories than he ever wrote, he said, yeah. right? <laughs> so, so I won't go into details, but uh, I think that the people that were interested in the deep woo part of those reports in the future we'll have uh, some more grist to chew on <laughs> oh thank goodness uh, like i from your inner yeah. i listened to that interview you did with plain as i was preparing for an interview last week and what i took away from that was that you weren't going to be doing woo anymore and i was like oh that's tragic the bitcoin is nice yeah. but i much prefer the woo you know <laughs> so, I mean? so, so do i but we, so yeah. we, you know we yeah. point back into the woo sector anyway. yeah in fact well we, but also also look at this okay just just as an aside the reason i'm so heavily into the bitcoin and everything is because of how it does affect the woo yeah. It was my goal to get all the woo-woo people that I could to move over into Bitcoin to expand their presence in reality by having those resources that money would provide. Okay, so if, if the woo-woo people could catch this wave, it would not just be the bankers, it would not just be the materialists. And, and who better to catch the wave than people that understand the value of what money can do to change things for, for uh, you know, this reality, right? And so that's really why I worked so hard to try and, and you know, years ago shouting Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin <laughs> in the interviews. And, you know, and some of those people have made millions of dollars and they are not like the materialists. They're out. These guys are out there changing the reality with that money. And so, you know, it does help. Yeah. Yep. I hope so. Yeah. And of course, you can find all of that at Cliff's website, halfpasthuman.com. And uh, that's going to run. And you can find Cliff back us back here with us sometime soon for part very three. Very soon, very soon. <laughs> for part three on time. We will, we will <laughs> yes. because we have lots of it. Um, that's going to wrap it up for this time. This is Off Planet Radio. Randy Moggins with Emily Moyer and our very special guest, Cliff High, is with us. Battles out there. It's inside you. Go forth. Fight it now. 
Good night. This is Off Planet Radio.